still on the road. Uh, Zoe and uh, Sarah Thompson uh, with me. Uh, Sarah Thompson back with us, pride of Winchester, Virginia. Say hello to the people, Sarah Thompson. Hi. <laughs> Welcome back, Sarah. Uh, Zoe uh, is uh, actively quarantining. Uh, Zoe stopped by the restaurant um, and I uh, just dropped her wines by the door uh, for her. Uh, she picks them up. Uh, she is back uh, sequestering um, in her Adams Morgan lair. Uh, we're gonna buy a little time here and I'm gonna give you a, a bit of a, a year in review uh, as well, year in review. So uh, a few numbers for you. Uh, I promise I haven't forgotten a bit of verse. Um, we're gonna do that after the year review so that um, you know those late to the lesson uh, get to enjoy it as well. Uh, we are on week 39. Week 39, we started doing this at the tail end uh, last Sunday uh, in uh, March of this year. Uh, it was actually uh, kind of my wife's idea. So uh, I was wondering uh, after the restaurant shut down, how to keep our staff actively uh, engaged and entertained in the restaurant project. And I thought uh, wine classes might be a fun way to do that. And uh, my wife said, if you're going to go through all that effort, you might as well uh, invite a larger group of people. So uh, we invited everybody and uh, I was overwhelmed by the response. And 39 weeks later, uh, you're still here. Uh, I'm amazed. But uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you all for um, creating and sustaining uh, this community uh, throughout pandemic. Um, it has been an amazing and unexpected experience uh, for me um, to, to be a part of, um, and I'm hugely grateful for it. Um, all right, so uh, year in review here. Um, we've done, uh, we're going to do, uh, by the end of the year, 40 uh, weekends worth of lessons. Um, if you uh, have perfect attendance, uh, figuring on three, four ounce glasses consumed uh, over the course of those 40 odd uh, lessons. And uh, I feel like for most of us, three, four ounce pours is probably the under. Um, I'm gonna take the over on this one, but assuming uh, relatively chaste, three, four ounce pours, uh, you will have consumed 480 ounces of wine, which is kind of a uh, difficult number to discern. Uh, that roughly equals 19 bottles, 19 bottles. So good on you. And again, I think that's the, the under uh, for, for most of us, it should be said. Uh, we have welcomed at least 20 guests, uh, 20 guests from all sorts of corners um, of the world, from France to Italy to Georgia, um, from Maryland uh, to Virginia to Oregon, uh, for the sake of these lessons. And uh, I'm hugely grateful uh, that we have yet to, um, you know, experience um, or uh, ignite a international or diplomatic incident. Uh, closest we came, I think, uh, was uh, associating Australians uh, with one of their uh, greatest uh, winemakers, Chester Osborne. Uh, we did get a letter from the embassy, uh, cease and desist for the sake of uh, sharing this particular photo that we're violating, um, you know, for the sake of our, our year in review. Uh, but uh, cheers to you, uh, Chester Auburn. Um, not all Australians dress that way. That's a very important PSA uh, for our Aussie friends. Uh, uh, Chester, an exception. Uh, to the rule. Uh, we enjoyed his dead arm Syrah from Old Vines um, in front of his preposterously modern uh, kind of uh, vineyard workshop there. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, amazing uh, that, you know, we've been able uh, to uh, welcome uh, 20 uh, I guess, over the course of uh, these uh, 40 uh, odd weeks and uh, an amazing opportunity to uh, create a, a sense of community um, within um, and amongst wine uh, professionals um, because we, you know, are a class of professional folks that really depend on, um, you know, travel uh, and trade uh, for the sake of uh, our livelihood and for the sake of sustaining our social lives. And uh, it's been really lovely to connect um, with all of those old friends for the sake of these lessons. Um, you know, on a more sobering note, we've lost hundreds of thousands um, of American lives. We've lost millions around the world. Um, we've seen uh, millions of lives, um, you know, irrevocably altered uh, for the sake of uh, this pandemic in our industry uh, and uh, in other industries. Um, we have been uh, proud of the charity work that we've been uh, able to do um, through uh, the course of this class. We've uh, raised over uh, $30,000 uh, for uh, at least uh, half a dozen uh, charitable concerns. Um, our uh, Workers' Relief Fund initially, uh, Miriam's Kitchen, uh, Seal USA, uh, for the sake of uh, 
Lebanese humanitarian work, um, Amatoto Village for the sake of reproductive rights and uh, women's health um, in Washington, D.C., Active Minds for the health of, um, uh, for the sake of mental health awareness and Campaign Zero uh, for the sake of an end to police brutality. Um, thank you all um, for participating um, in those fundraisers and uh, giving of your time uh, and of your wealth uh, as well. Um, we've had three hosts. Uh, Joan is not with us. Uh, big ups to Joan. We love you uh, as well, uh, Zoe and Sarah. Joan, actually the original host, uh, it should be said. Uh, we dropped uh, countless uh, XF bombs. Um, I've subjected you to the same pathetic rotation of about half a dozen t-shirts um, over the course of these lessons. Uh, we've managed to record uh, 36 now, 37 of them going on strong. Uh, there remain uh, two lost lessons. Uh, hopefully there's some kind of like Grateful Dead uh, bootleg situation happening uh, for the sake of uh, sustainable Austria and Virginia, which remains one of my favorite lessons. I, I totally blew it uh, on that one. Um, and uh, Sarah Thompson, all I want for Christmas is my two front teeth, my two front teeth. So um, uh, two, uh, I had two front teeth. So if you revisit uh, lesson number two, uh, you will notice uh, that they are missing. Um, uh, they are now hugely fake, but uh, you know, uh, permanent enough uh, that uh, I don't forget to put them in uh, for the sake of our lessons. So uh, amazing, uh, good on you. Uh, we're gonna kick it off with a bit of verse uh, as we always do and uh, this is kind of by request, and uh, as a word of explanation, we are broadcasting live from Reveler's Hour, um, and uh, the uh, name of our restaurant uh, owes uh, itself to a bit of ancient Greek verse. This is Thomas More's translation of Anacreon. Sculptor, wouldst thou glad my soul, grave for me an ample bowl, worthy to shine in hall or bower, when springtime brings the Reveler's Hour, grave it with Themes of chaste design fit for a simple board like mine. Display not there the barbarous rites in which religious zeal delights, nor any tale of tragic fate which history shudders to relate. No call thy fancies from above. Themes of heaven, themes of love, let Bacchus, Jove's ambrosial boy, distill the grape in drops of joy. And while he smiles at every tear, let warm eyed Venus dancing near with spirits of the genial bed. The dewy herbage deftly tread. Let love be there without his arms and timid nakedness of charms. And all the graces linked with love stray, laughing through the shadowy grove, while rosy boys disporting round in circlets trip the velvet crown. But ah, if Apollo toys, I tremble for the rosy boys. Um, uh, it should be said that uh, Apollo was not always good to uh, his uh, hashtag uh, rosy, rosy boys. Um, uh, the rosy boys had a very short um, uh, lifespan. They were a bit like the Spinal Tap drummers um, of the uh, ancient world. So uh, that poem uh, ends uh, with a, a bit of a warning uh, to uh, potential um, rosy boys uh, out there. Um, want to thank everyone who participated uh, in uh, the survey. Um, thrilled to have uh, all your responses. Um, we're probably going to go long, so you know, um, everybody strap in. We got a lot of wine to go through. Uh, it's going to be amazing. Um, I've got you know one more activity. Uh, here, uh, this is uh, largely by request, and um, I'm grateful I did the survey because I didn't know that I had a career as a sommelier slash rapper um, until we got uh, uh, many, you know, kind of responses uh, to that effect. So um, I wanted to kind of revisit um, a year um, in Tail Up Goat Wine School um, through the work of uh, Hova. Hova, um, uh, none other than Jay Z. Uh, loves wine, has his own wine, uh, purchased Armand de Brignac's uh, Ace of Spades. There is Hova. Um, and he's not only celebrating Chris or Hennessy, um, you know, uh, Hova's love runs deep uh, for wine. And I'm going to uh, drop uh, a few lyrics from, from Choice Tracks. Um, so uh, this is for uh, lesson uh, number three, uh, which we devoted to uh, Cabernet uh, Sauvignon. Uh, this is off of Show Me What You Got. Give the drummer some shit. I already got the summer some. It's the winner's turn. Hobie Hove is the coldest. I'm just getting better with time. I'm like Opus, one young, no two alike, like a snowflake. So that is uh, Opus 1 reference, everyone, uh, keeping uh, score at home. That is Opus 1 uh, that Hova is dropping, which is one of Cal uh, California's most famous um, uh, cab sobs. Uh, Number two reference, uh, this is actually, I, I'd heard this one before, and it made me fall in love uh, with Jay-Z a little bit because 
uh, he's dropping rhymes about uh, rosé, um, which is amazing. You know, pink wine. Uh, this is in uh, third off the track thirty something. Y'all roll blunts. I smoke Cubans all day. Y'all youngins chase. I'm Patron and it's straight. I like South Beach, but I'm in San Tropez. Y'all drink dumb, but not rosé. Hey, um, so uh, he is celebrating rosé and San Tropez um, and pronouncing it correctly for the sake of uh, his rhyme. So uh, good on you, uh, Hova. Uh, number three is one of my favorite because not only do we get a uh, a wine reference here. We get a vintage drop. I can't think of another rapper alive today that is dropping not only uh, wines, but vintages. Y'all can't even drink Chris Owl on this one. You got drink Chris All. Woo! Buy some red wine, a little guy at 9-7. You're so contagious, I can't take it. This is for the grown and sexy. Have my baby, let's just make it. Um, so that's Gaia 1997. Uh, Gaia, one of the most famous Barbarescos of all time. Uh, the 97 Vintage, I had to do some uh, searching on this. I didn't know uh, as much, but um, Wine Spectator says that 97 was a super ripe, opulent, flamboyant year. So that's a, that is a great hip-hop vintage, uh, 97. Um, I promise I'm only subjecting you to two more of these uh, for the sake of, uh, but this is apparently by popular demand. Um, so uh, it should be said that uh, uh, Hova um, got into it uh, with um, a uh, French doucher named Frederick Rousson. Uh, who is uh, the chairman of Louis Roderer, uh, who bit the hand that fed him. So rappers love Cristal. They rhyme about it and rap about it a lot. They are responsible for the fact that Cristal is a hugely successful luxury brand. Um, when asked about the, the popularity of Cristal, uh, Frederick Rousseau, uh said, we can't forbid people from buying it. What the fuck, dude? Um, you know, you are totally uh, off base. Um, you know, the hip hop community is responsible for um, your market share, but, uh, you know, uh, they're a little too, uh, you know, dark skinned uh, for your taste. So uh, Hova obviously took exception to that. Um, he took so much exception to it um, that he wrote a diss track. Uh, so I used to drink Cristal, motherfuckers racist, so I switched gold bottles onto that spade shit. You gonna have another drink or you gonna babysit <laughs> onto the next one? Somebody call the waitress. Uh, so I like, I like the babysit waitress. Uh, racist as shit, uh, so all over the place there. And then on uh, the final track, I promise this is this is ending soon. Uh, Tom Ford, this is by far the best one because he crams uh, three prime wine references into one track. Paris, where we been, pardon my Parisian. It's hope time in no time. It's fuck y'all season. Piss Bordeaux and Burgundies. Flush out a Riesling. When hoes out, them hoes, y'all put y'all weaves in. So uh, we've managed to rhyme Riesling with weaves in. Bow down to Jay-Z, um, the, the true uh, master of uh, rhymes and wine. Um, I apologize. I will never do that again uh, for the sake of students. Hopefully you're minorly uh, entertained uh, for the sake of that exercise. Uh, without further ado, we're going to move on to the wines. Um, wanted to take you back. Um, we are uh, doing a blind tasting here for the sake of your exam. We're moving it back to the tasting grid um, and the hugely successful uh Finally remembered, discontinued season one of Flying Blind um, with uh, Zoe and, and Bill. Um, uh, I want to take you back to uh, lesson number one. Um, it was uh, devoted to uh, Chardonnay and the Basics of Tasting. We originally went through the tasting grid. We will do so today. This is uh, me trying to figure out Zoom. Um, I had never used Zoom uh, prior to 2020. Um, you know, show of hands if you hadn't used Zoom. Didn't know what Zoom was uh, prior to 2020. I had, you know, absolutely uh, no idea uh, what I was in for. Um, and, you know, hopefully um, I'm more proficient, um, you know, than, than I, uh, well, I'm more proficient now than I, than I was then, although not much. We feel, still find ways to uh, mess it up uh, week in and week out. Um, I, I really, uh, I enjoyed uh, this particular screen grab uh, for the sake of uh, our inaugural lesson because I had yet to master the uh, share screen function um, and was uh, going analog for the sake of the share screen um, initially for several episodes. And then one of our lawyer listeners said, uh, Bill, you know, um, you can actually just, you know, share images uh, on, on your monitor. So uh, thankfully, uh, we went from uh, cardstock cutouts to uh, sharing, uh, sharing the screen. We're, we're older uh, and, and we're wiser. Uh, now, uh, when 2020 started, I had uh, no T-shirts with my face uh, on them. Uh, I thought Tiger King was a, a cartoon character um, and not, um, you know, a 
uh, reality television. Uh, so sure, we were uh, we were younger um, then and uh, more innocent uh, for it. Uh, but uh, we didn't know half as much about wine and, and we hadn't, you know, uh, fully uh, become acquainted and we hadn't fully sussed out this notion of wine transmitting a sense of place, which is where we're going today for the sake of our first lesson. Without further ado, let's taste some motherfucking wine, everybody. All right. Uh, Zoe, um, uh, Sarah, uh, I'm sharing the tasting grid. Um, you guys. Uh, kind of lead us through this first wine, wine number one, uh, Flight Blanc. Um, but ironically, um, we're going through sight, smell, and taste here first. Um, you know, what strikes you guys um, about uh, this uh, alleged Blanc number one? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it's kind of rosy. Yeah. In the glass. Yeah, so- um, Somebody you know, was saying it smelled a lot like rose petals, which I totally agree with. Absolutely. And also has kind of this peaches and cream thing going on. Nice. Uh, it should be said that all the wines we are tasting today um, were uh, kind of culled from your favorites um, over the course of the year, uh, both uh, via sales through the store and uh, your responses to the survey. So these are all wines that we have tasted uh, and learned about uh, through the course of our many weeks uh, together. Um, so what do you guys get on the, on the nose? We talked about rose petals on the palate. You know, um, let's assess this wine, acidity, um, you know, dryness, level of alcohol, and tannins. This is the first time I've blind tasted wine since I was with you in the restaurant. This is amazing. Oh, amazing. It's like riding a bicycle. Um, and uh, at home, feel free to, you know, throw out, throw out the responses. Um, I throw out those tasting notes um, as they arise. Um, you know, this has a little bit of that old lady perfume thing uh, mm -hmm. going on for Betel Rouge, but I think it's, you know, remarkably fresh uh, on the nose. Um, so, you know, we know we're dealing with a, a wine that, you know, potentially, um, in spite of coming from white grapes, um, you know, is picked up some, some pigment, um, you know, um, through the action of, you know, maceration. Um, perhaps on the skin. So, um, you know, that is a, a spoiler alert uh, for the sake of uh, this particular offering, uh, number one. Zoe and Sarah, do you guys want to hazard a guess <laughs> about what you're drinking here? Come on. Because it's so floral, my like initial reaction was to go to something like the Verschtraminer, but I don't get the weight, although it does have a significant amount of body. Um, I think it has that like what you guys talked about, um, that like pickled watermelon rind situation, along with all of the like lavender and beautiful florals. Um, it has a bit of salinity to, to it as well. Like that salty dip is really coming through, which I don't think that it would be Gerberts demeanor. And then going off of just theoretical things, any other grapes that would have some pigment to it. I don't really think it's Pinot Gris either, which makes me think it's like Moscafiliero. And that's where I'll... Thompson. I'll keep that. Thompson, Thompson seconds the Moscofilero. Um, whose Moscofilero would this be, pray tell? Hoof and Lore. Hoof and Lore. We have one vote for Hoof and Lore. You're one for one. No, um, nice no, one. no. Uh, nice oh, yes. done. Uh, that is the Moscofilero, Hoof and Lore. Uh, please you raise your hand at home uh, if, uh, if you got that one. Good on you. Um, uh, I hope, you know, that uh, through the course of these lessons, one of the things that, you know, you have learned is that, you know, um, in wine as in life, you know, there uh, are many shades of gray. This is Moscofilero on the vine. Um, it is often considered a white grape, but um, in nature, you know, there, you know, are, are no, you know, uh, you know, real, um, you know, kind of uh, hard and, and fast you know, rules about, you know, what is, you know, purely red or white when it comes to grape. You know, there are all sorts of, you know, uh, shades of, you know, ruddy colored pink and, you know, um, rose and, you know, even on individual bunches, you know, multiple, um, you know, kind of levels of, um, you know, kind of red and purple uh, on individual grapes. And, you know, Pinot Gris, uh, Moscow Filaro, uh, most famously, you know, are varietals that, uh, if they're allowed any time on the skins, give you wines that, you know, aren't quite purely wet. Um, and uh, what you get there is this wonderful aromatic dimension that this wine has, which I think people really um, loved. Um, and uh, additionally, 
um, you know, you get a little weight um, that, that you wouldn't have otherwise. And uh, I will say, you know, one of my favorite things about, you know, this particular offering is that, you know, in spite of, um, you know, that weight and those aromatics, um, it is remarkably uh, fresh. Um, so uh, for the sake of this first one, we were re revisiting uh, lesson number 20, um, and uh, that centered around the island of Pe uh, Pelops. So uh, this is an offering from the Peloponnese, uh, from Montania. Um, it is Moscofilero on the skins for several hours, um, which accounts for the color. Um, and uh, it is um, styled by the younger winemakers as a wine inspired by their grandfather's wine. So, you know, um, you know, traditionally uh, in previous generations, um, you know, they would have given uh, the wine a little time on the skins to add um, added depth um, and intrigue and aromatics. Um, and, you know, that's something that uh, Hoppenler has adopted. Our true piece is the winery up and lower the name brand, um, inspired um, by, um, you know, uh, Greek mythological figures, which appeals to us for obvious reasons, given that Anacreon, uh, you know, uh, stole the show uh, to kick things off. So uh, tasting number one, you guys, for one for one, uh, nicely, nicely done. Uh, there's a rigidly enforced honor code um, at the Tail of Goat Wine School for those of you participating uh, from home. On to wine number two um, in uh, Selection Blanc. Um, so wine number two, uh, more conventionally um, white, uh, certainly, uh, it should be said. Uh, thoughts about this one, uh, kids at home? I get almost nothing on the nose. We're really resetting, good. already <laughs> resetting the nose, Thompson. <laughs> already reset. Uh, Zoe, coming, this is, this is hard, coming off of the Moscofilero, I think, you know, we're going from a wine that screams to a wine that whispers a bit. Um, so uh, what you got uh, on the nose, uh, if anything, for the sake of this wine? There's like a little bit of a white lifesaver thing going on. Uh, the pineapple lifesaver? Is that pineapple? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a good, that's a good lifesaver. Um, it actually makes, uh, Mayor's family always gave out the holiday lifesaver pack, uh, which I'm looking forward to in a few days time. Um, I think that, I think the white, the white lifesaver and I think the white and then the uh, the cherry lifesaver are the best ones. Um, Zoe, what else you got? This is the point where again I I would try to rely on theoretical knowledge, but all I'm saying is like lemon balm and like river rocks, river and rocks. Citrus, citrus, which basically means it smells like not that much of anything. River rocks a great tasting note to throw out when the wine doesn't really smell like anything. So um, <laughs> exactly, you're struggling. Um, you know, to figure out. So um, uh, let's make some, uh, as uh, Sarah's cat makes a guest appearance, let's make some, you know, broad stroke generalizations about um, what we're dealing with in terms of old or new world. Does this, you know, initially on the nose uh, to you guys feel like something from the old or new world, you know? Old. Old. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, these wines that whisper uh, classically tend to be from, um, you know, the continent um, uh, more, more often than not. And, you know, inspired by a set of traditions uh, that values nuance um, and, you know, uh, a certain level of kind of food friendliness uh, in wine, as opposed to more bombast. Um, all right, let's drink it. Mm. Um, does the palate confirm the nose uh, for you guys? Thoughts? Nods, we've got nods. Yes, yeah, so far, yes, you get river rocks on the palate, Zoe. We do. It's all about the minerality here. Minerality. Layered that layered minerality um, as a as a tasting note. Um, so, you know, you've got an ubiquitously mineral driven old world white. Um, I think, you know, a lot of uh, you at home who are actually, you know, uh, treating this as a blind tasting might wonder, you know, to yourselves, you know, how the hell do you go from, you know, this ubiquitously, you know, crisp, you know, kind of um, clean, uh, wine to a discernible guess about, you know, what we're dealing with. And this is where you read the tea leaves and, you know, you, you try to parse hairs um, uh, to get a sense of what you're dealing with. And I think you start to rule things out. So we ruled out, you know, uh, the new world. I think, you know, we ruled out, you know, some grapes um, that, you know, thicker skinned white varietals or, or tend to be, you know, more ripe, opulent uh, white varietals. We, you know, leaning into uh, white grapes that are you know, kind of higher in acid. So what, you know, classic old world grapes does that encompass? I mean, I don't think it's a Chardonnay. You think uh, we have a, um, a call of Chablis, which I think is really smart. Right. They still yeah. don't get that weight. 
Yeah. Um, and Chardonnay is a bit of a chameleon. You know, Chardonnay is kind of all things to all people. It can be crisp and flinty, um, you know, smoky um, and, you know, intensely chalky, um, like Chablis, um, you know, which, you know, itself, you know, comes from, you know, these chalky, uh, famously chalky Kimmeridgean soils, uh, Kimmeridgean and Devonian soils. Um, uh, or, you know, Chardonnay can be this, you know, lush, um, you know, uh, dancing hippo um, of, of a wine. Um, uh, so this doesn't say Chardonnay. Why doesn't it say Chardonnay to you? Well, specifically on the Chablis, it just doesn't, um, I don't get the, um, I don't get the Kimmeridgean uh, soil. Like I don't, it doesn't taste like the decaying seashore to me. Um, there's a lot of talk about um, it being like an Anjou, oh, no, oh, that you're saying it's not an Anjou Blanc. Never mind. I'm trying to read the chat. Oh, you're saying it's <laughs> uh, that, is a, <laughs> that is a great guess or a great reveal uh, for, the, for the audience. Um, this is indeed uh, the Anjou Blanc. Um, this is Mary Taylor's wine. Uh, I think Anjou Blanc, uh, <laughs> a surprise hit. Uh, Mary Taylor's wines in general were a, su a surprise hit. Um, it should be said that initially uh, we were hoping to have both Pascaline Le Petier and Mary Taylor um, uh, on the uh, Chenin Blanc program. Uh, uh, little did I know that they had like old like uh, New York Psalm rappers beef uh, from back in, back in the day. So they like canceled each other out. Um, but I feel good about Team Mary. Um, uh, she is a, a two-time, uh, you know, a guest star on the Taylor Coat Wine School. And um, I, I have to say, you know, I haven't checked the figures on it, but this has to be, uh, you know, one of the bottles we sold the most of in the store. And I think it's because matter, matter of fact, delicious, matter of factly delicious. Um, you know, for those of you at home wondering, you know, how do you tell this is Chenin Blanc in a blind tasting? Uh, for me, you know, one tasting that we didn't touch on um, is this wet wool. Um, kind of thing uh, uh, that this has in spades um, uh, and, you know, this like flintiness, smokiness, um, you know, kind of like um, uh, the, the French would say Pierre Fissid, so like this notion of, uh, which sometimes Sancerre has as well, but, but uh, you know, uh, coupled with that wet wool, you know, leans more into this kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of zesty, you know, preserved lemon direction that takes you into uh, a Chenin Blanc place. Um, and uh, what's additionally kind of cool about this wine is that um, you know, it is uh, two reflects two different soil types in the region. So uh, you're dealing with both, um, uh, you know, Anjou Blanc and Anjou Noir, so chalkier um, soils from the Paris Basin, and then uh, more kind of dark schist soils from the Massif Americain. Um, and, and those two sites come together to give a wine that's wonderfully well balanced, uh, but still easy drinking. Uh, moving on, wine number wine number three. Go, Zoe. What do you got? Behind him, behind him, behind. Uh, Thompson, are you ready? No. <laughs> uh, come on. I warned you. I warned you to break out the amphetamines prior to this tasting. We're covering 12 wines, damn it. Um, you know, speaks to the, the tasting get progressively longer, um, you know, as as the wine, you know, we're, <laughs> we're going to have like a, uh, it'll be like the, the readings, uh, you know, it'll be like the readings of Joyce on Bloomsday. We'll have all day tastings in no time. Um, uh, what do you got? Wine number three. Hit me. Uh, oh, this, this smells like, okay, this is like, this brings me back to an old tasting note that I used to, <laughs> to bring up that you used to make fun of me for, but you know those rubber bouncy balls in ch children's great, stores? Great tasting note. Um, or you get them in uh, like for a quarter. Um, yeah, yes, love those. Yes, yeah. those. Yeah, yeah, those are awesome. Uh, that is a, I, I can smell, it actually reminds me of the, uh, I have a different, like, you remember the little finger puppets that you put on? Like the, yeah, it has, a, I think they use the same plastic. Um, yeah, they're probably all made in China, uh, but anyway, so yeah, um, mass produced, you know, Chinese child toys is the, uh, is the, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, Zoe, what do you got on the, uh, the bouncy balls? Sweet plastic for sure. Um, I second Lisa Marie saying petrol, um, which is, um, you know, kind of with a lot of like pretty florals to it. This one's shown well. Um, and I think it's a great example of a wine that you know, kind of defies expectations a little bit um, on the palate. You know, I think you get that like, uh, you know, uh, rubberized, um, you know, kind of plastic thing on the on the nose, but uh, much more honeyed, uh, much more of that like golden gram, um, you know, kick uh, on, on the back end and wine's high acid, but has this lovely weight um, and this like kind of sun-kissed fruit component. Um, so, uh, you know, and, you know, kind of, I think it's as broad as, it's, as it is long, um, you know, uh, for the sake of our, our you know, inquiry um and definitely more substantive uh than the Anjou Blanc we just um tasted so you know for the vine tasters at home you know that would you know kind of point us to a warmer region 
Um, you know, he's still dealing with a line that, you know, is, is you know, medium plus in terms of acidity, um, but, uh, you know, from a, a slightly warmer region than um, Anjou, um, which is, you know, famously chilly. Um, uh, uh, any guesses as to what you're dealing with here? Um, uh, from the chat, Josh, Josh and Rachel say that it's definitely ovum off the grid, which I think is a really solid answer. Wow. It's not ovum. I do think it's definitely Riesling. Um, the thing is, because of you, we've had so many Rieslings. So yes, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> so going uh, on to that, and I, I was worried that uh, I it should be it should be noted that I <laughs> I intentionally. Um, didn't ask, uh, you know, the class about their least favorite uh, episodes um, because my confidence is fragile at the moment. It's been the end of a long, <laughs> a long year. We're still waiting, you know, for additional relief from the government. I just, I just couldn't take it. My ego couldn't stand it. Uh, so maybe, you know, um, you know, in a few months' time, you know, we'll uh, open the floodgates for all the wine school trolls. Um, I got one. One brief note about Sherry being the least favorite lesson, but that's okay. Sherry's not for everybody, but um, uh, at, at, at any rate, um, uh, I was glad that we didn't get, you know, too many respondents uh, saying what the fuck is with all the Riesling. Uh, more often than not, you, you all uh, graciously opened yourself up to uh, the summer thereof uh, and, uh, you know, Riesling from uh, all the corners of the world. So, you know, thank you for indulging that passion of, of mine. Um, this is indeed Riesling. It is indeed Josh Jer Hanker, killing it, uh, star students. Uh, it is uh, Ovum's Off the Grid, uh, which is uh, from uh, Oregon, uh, as you might remember. This was uh, our wine school uh, introduction um, to uh, concrete eggs, um, it, should, it should be said. Um, uh, every bit they, it was like uh, internet memes. Uh, I was actually looking for each of these uh, lessons. So Oregon recently is number 13. I was trying to find online if I could get, you know, notes about, you know, the number one Netflix show in streaming for each week. I thought that would be a fun thing to revisit, but um, uh, that data is more difficult to, to come by uh, than you might imagine. But uh, this was our introduction to Concrete Eggs. John House um, at Ovum Wines, who participated from his backyard, um, uh, does a lot of work in Concrete Eggs. Um, this is a wine aged in Concrete Eggs. And he said, kind of strips away, John's a musician, but he said it kind of strips away uh, the treble and amplifies the bass notes on these wines. So this is kind of like the, the low rider, um, the dub music of uh, Riesling's here. Um, but uh, showing really beautifully, fun to revisit. I haven't tried this in a while. So um, I'm grateful that uh, as many of you um, identified it as a favorite um, as you did. And it should be said, you know, um, as long as I've been doing this, um, I'm continually uh, surprised by what resonates and, and what doesn't. Um, and, you know, I, I really adore and enjoy uh, those, those um, you know, pleasant uh, surprises. Um, you know, less pleasant when, you know, you're really excited about something and, you know, nobody else likes it. But, you know, that's never stopped me uh, from, you know, four things, things on the drinking public before. So uh, moving on, wine number four. Um, uh, another one, um, you know, what do we call this color? What is this madness? Amber. Amber. Yeah, I like amber. You know, if you're, if you're yeah, yeah. If you're more profane, you say orange. Can I get one of those orange wines? Um, yeah, but we're not going there. We're saying amber. Amber is a more a more poetic uh, word than orange. And uh, you know, you all have uh, like uh, you know Riesling indulged um, you know orange orange wine. Uh, you all were very excited uh, about orange wine. It, it should be it should be said it was one of our most requested lessons um, prior to um, you know actually uh, unveiling uh, you know a full class. Uh, devoted to it. Um, this is definitely an orange wine, um, uh, but which orange wine are we dealing with? Sarah Thompson, any guesses? Oh man, okay. Next level nerdery, we're blind tasting orange wines. This is, this is not on the court's, um, you know, traditional tasting method, um, um, like grid, hashtag cancel the court. Um, but, uh, you know, it should be said uh, that you're not going to be tested on this. Um, uh, for the sake of your advanced or master psalm test that you should never take uh, to begin with. But uh, what do you got? Ooh, it's a little toasty. <laughs> toasty? toasty <laughs> I've had three glasses of wine already. I'm just, I'm just here for the ride. <laughs> all right, all right. Hey, okay, she's toasted. Um, <laughs> Actually, I was, uh, just said we, did a, we did a private tasting uh, with a group of um, Georgetown oncologists um, they were as, you know, 
hammered and unruly, as you might imagine Georgetown and colleges to be. Uh, but uh, they suggested a real-time blood alcohol graph uh, for participants, which I thought would be a huge and amazing innovation uh, for the sake of our wine school. Uh, but that would involve a lot of finger pricking uh, over the course of the lesson. I don't know. That, that feels, you know, not very enjoyable. Uh, Zoe, you got a guess? I think it's Georgian. Uh, it could be Cazzatelli, it could be Mitzvane, it could be Mitzvane and Cazzatelli. Um, uh, going on, but I, I went before. with. I went almost exclusively with monovarietal wines for the sake I wanted to maintain the integrity of this tasting exercise. Um, Zoe, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, which Georgian varietal are you dealing with, and what region are you dealing with first? So you know enough about Georgia to tell me what region uh, we are in. Kerketi? Yes. <laughs> yep. um, so uh, I would hope that uh, you all at home know more about Georgia as a country than you ever expected to. Uh, otherwise, I haven't done uh, my, my job. Uh, I am on the payroll, after all. I'm not really on the payroll, but uh, the Georgian government tangentially paid for me to go there a few years ago. So I feel like I have to pay it back. Um, but Kekete is the hot, dry, arid California of Georgia, albeit, you know, on the uh, east, you know, end of the country as opposed to the west end. Um, this is made in the traditional Keketian style, um, aged for six months on the skins in Kavevri, which are, Sarah Thompson. What, what Kavevri are? Yeah, come on, let them know. <laughs> These big clay pots. Big clay pots buried in the womb of the earth. Um, yes, exactly. You a picture? They're massive and ancient fermentation vessels for wine. Uh, uh, Sarah, your final chance, what Georgian varietal are we dealing with for the sake of this Kegetian wine made in big clay pots? So I initially said Orgo, and then I'm, now I'm reading the chat, and I'm, I'm going to go with the crowd and go Orgo Svania. You guys are killing it. This is the Svane. Uh, this is uh, Timur and Gogi uh, Dakashvili's Svane. Um, uh, at home, and um, this is another one. Like I, I love this wine, uh, but it was one that I was worried uh, about, you know, kind of uh, dropping uh, for the sake of a tasting, just because you know this is orange wine for you know the orange wine drinking crowd. You know, it is unapologetically orange um, in uh, in a manner of speaking, and I, I dig that about it. But um, you know, uh, the the lesson being never underestimate your your wine school students uh, at home. Uh, without further ado, let's get to switch them out. Uh, red wine. Uh, red, red wine. So uh, if you're at home, um, you know, uh, finish uh, your existing glass and we move on now to uh, a flight of uh, red wines here. Um, uh, and going in order, um, of course, uh, beginning with uh, Rouge One, Rouge One, which sounds like uh, like a new Star Wars franchise. Um, but uh, uh, Zoe, uh, I see you jumping there. Um, uh, Thompson, are you with us? Rouge One, what do you got? Here. Yeah, I got it. Uh, what do you smell? Which one? Mm. Oh, we're resetting. We're resetting again. Uh, for those of you at home, uh, Sarah Thompson is resetting uh, her olfactory cavity there. Um, and that is important because, um, you know, the nose, not unlike staring at the sun, you know, which is fun from time to time, but, you know, uh, you lose a spot in your vision. And, and very often smelling wine you know, your, uh, your receptors, uh, your nasal receptors will get fatigued, uh, you know, the same way that your, um, your eyes do. Um, and, uh, you know, smelling a shirt, smelling something neutral um, is, is one way to reset them. So that's something that you actually see a lot of wine uh, folk do at, uh, you know, uh, professional uh, tastings. Uh, Thompson, what do you got? Raspberries. Mm. Raspberry, that's a good one. Um, like a raspberry jam thing. Ooh. Oh wow! This has opened up quite a bit. Um, this this uh, uh, smells uh, very different than it did uh, when uh, we initially opened it. Um, yeah, it's like super jammy uh, in a fun way. Um, uh, darker skin, great, but you know, apparently lighter wine. Um, uh, you know, uh, do you get anything other than uh, jam situation? Oh, that was really bright, like really nice sweet plums. I guess there's a bit of a sour cherry going on. Yeah, um, I think it's like more. It, you know, there's definitely something like, uh, you know, ripe and developing about it, but, you know, it's tart. I think there's a, a connotation, like a connotation of a tart uh, fruit um, on this one. So, you know, you may be dealing with, you know, a, a, uh, a warmer region, but, you know, a warmer region in the context of, you know, a set of grapes that still readily retains um, acid 
uh, nicely. Um, and you know, we're not, we're not huge fans of clunky red wines, so you're not going to find that for the take for the sake of this wine tasting, but, um, you know, we're dealing with one of those kind of uh, middle of the road, um, you know, red varietals, uh, a grape that capable of, you know, berry fruit ripeness, but still, um, you know, bright and drinkable. Um, uh, any guesses as to what we're dealing with? Ooh, I really like that. This is kind of fun. Um, you know, I think for all the ripeness on the nose, um, you know, it, it should be said it's a wine that, you know, registers, you know, um, you know, pretty uh, lightly on the palate, you know, in terms of the alcohol, uh, at least, you know, it's relatively high out, you know, um, higher acid um, and, and lower alcohol. So uh, again, that, you know, kind of points to, um, you know, kind of a, a cooler climate zone, um, but, you know, a slightly warmer subregion. Um, this is testable uh, for the sake of you, um, you know, home, uh, you know, uh, WSET and uh, court nerds. This is a testable grape, but is a challenging testable grape. Um, it's hard because the tears are slightly stained, but I'm not. Yeah, so you know, I'm not the, that it's any of the grapes that we usually blind. Yeah, you're dealing with the you're dealing with a grape that you know has some pigment to it, but doesn't necessarily give massive wines. Um, you know, and there are a lot of grapes like that um, that you know counterintuitively, you know, um, carry a lot of color with them. Um, color doesn't have a lot necessarily to do um, with, with body, with alcohol. You can have, you know, kind of lower alcohol wines that nonetheless are inky in the glass. Uh, any guesses uh, from the commentaries or from uh, my two amazing uh, legendary co-hosts? I don't even think it's a Syrah. So what? I don't think it's I know. Syrah. Let's, let's go through what we don't think it is. Yeah, what is it not? It could be, it could be Grenache, but I don't know. I feel like that's kind of a BS answer. Okay. So I'll say what, what people are saying in the um, chats, but I also, you know what this kind of reminds me of? The uh, Sangiovese that's in the wooden, the wicker basket. Oh, oh the, the yeah, old school, the old school Chianti. Yeah. Chianti. Yeah. Yeah. It's race Chianti driven. All that like sour cherry. Especially. Yeah. Yeah, I can it's tell a little that. bit lighter in concentration, mm -hmm. but it. All right, so uh, <laughs> home, we're taking just a hint. We're taking it back to lesson number twenty-one. Lesson number twenty-one. Um, uh, so, uh, without further ado, we are dealing with the Pinot Noir of Eastern Europe, which makes it Cobol's Blau Frankish. Cobol's Blau Frankish. Um, so. Uh, you know, Slovenia is one of those, uh, you know, kind of country and, and lessons that, um, you know, really pleasantly surprised me. Um, I, uh, you know, we didn't have any illustrious guest stars, but uh, I wholeheartedly enjoyed learning about Slovene wine and, um, you know, was hugely impressed at the number of people that came out of the woodwork that either, either like been to Slovenia, wanted to share their, you know, honeymoon pictures, wanted to share their love of the place, the culture, the people, and Slovene wine. And, you know, uh, it's one of those, you know, very wistful, you know, Jesus, it'd be really nice to go there uh, kind of moments. But, um, you know, uh, as such, we had to live vicariously um, through uh, through the glass. Um, this one, um, you know, it comes from um, a producer in uh, Prodravsh, um, uh, but, uh, you know, a, a uh, vineyard, um, uh, you know, in this kind of more southerly region of Slovenia, Podavska, um, and uh, a grape in Blau Frankish that, um, you know, is, you know, very widely grown and, and, you know, has a lot of the same qualities of Pinot Noir um, in terms of acidity and fruit, but, you know, for me, has this more kind of like savage, um, you know, meaty, um, you know, fruits the forest thing uh, going on, uh, which I really did. Um, without further ado, moving on to wine number two. Uh, wine number two. Um, uh, kick it, uh, Chicas, what do you got? Holy God. You were warned. Come on. This, ooh, this is a nice, like... Oh, it's older. Yeah, very... There's some uh, amber. How do you know it is older? There's some browning around the, the rim. Nice, browning around the rim. Um, that tells you it's an older wine. Um, uh, or alternatively, grape that is susceptible to browning. Um, uh, what do you get on the nose? It's all tertiary. Uh, the, f you know, fancy way of saying it's an old wine. Um, I'm thinking of like crunchy autumn leaves. A jump into a fall leaf pile of wine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mushroomy. 
mushroomy. Uh, you get a little bit of that, like, uh, John Wayne, you know, comes up to the bar, um, asks for a glass of wine kind of thing. Um, you know, grandpa's leather chair, pipe tobacco. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely dried florals, dried fruit. Yeah. But pretty, too, in its own way. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, texturally, you know, this is a really dynamic wine, so we're going from a wine uh, in the Blanc Francais that had, like, no tannins to speak of to wine that, you know, is discernibly tannic. Um, put it all together, guys. You can do this. I believe in you. What are we drinking? Nebbiolo. Drinking Nebbiolo. Of course we're drinking Nebbiolo. Um, uh, come on. You can do better than that. Uh, which <laughs> Nebbiolo are we drinking? Um, I think it could be uh, the most handsome, uh, what's his name? Leonardo Azalea? Leonardo, Leonardo. A beautiful man in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Very enjoy. Oh, look at him. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, yes. Uh, that's, that's very evocative, too. I feel like uh, he's like reverse, you know, uh, eving it. He's like offering you the. Lorenzo. the uh, yeah, exactly. The Read fruit, Lorenzo. The of knowledge. Um, yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is a Barolo. It is from uh, Brico Fiasco, um, which is my favorite potential uh, Italian um, uh, MC name, Brico Fiasco. Um, it is their original vineyard. Um, it is in Castiglione uh, uh, Paletto, which is um, kind of like sandwiched in, in the, this like transitional zone of Barolo between the two different major soil types, um, uh, both kind of old school and new school in the sense that it sees a very extended maceration, 60 days, uh, but uh, some newer oak. Uh, over the course of extended elvage, uh, showing beautifully, just like a blockbuster wine. Um, on to number three, what do you got? Thompson, come on. I'm sorry. You can do this. We believe in you. I know. I'm trying. Remember, you're professional. Woo. Okay. God, that wine is so good. Uh, what was the vintage? Uh, that is uh, 2013. Uh, which is a hugely, uh, you know, heralded uh, vintage uh, in, in Barolo. Uh, I think the wine's showing beautifully, uh, but, you know, it's one that, you know, has, uh, you know, some additional aging potential uh, as well. We tried three crews against uh, one another uh, for the sake of that lesson number 28, um, which remains one of my favorite lessons, just, you know, purely uh, for the sake of, um, you know, the wines that we had on offer. Um, I feel like we barely explored um, the Alto Piemontesi, um, offerings uh, there. Um, Nebbiolo is just, you know, one of life's great joys. Um, Rolo is expensive, um, but, uh, you know, it is a, a wine, you know, worth, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, shilling out uh, a little money for. What do we got here? Sounds a little bit like burnt hair. Burnt hair, nice. Salon, that fixer, yeah. yeah. Uh, what else? I was going to say it kind of does smell well, I think, younger Nebbiolo smells. Um, I get some really nice like tart berries. I have a woody aspect to it. A little um, bit of, like a little wet soil. So honestly, I wondered for the sake of this tasting whether these wines were too like to feature back to back, but I couldn't, um, given the public response to uh, these particular offerings, not include them uh, in the tasting. Um, so I think it'd be fun to, you know, kind of uh, for our sake, you know, how would you, um, you know, qualify? So I think in terms of, you know, acid structure, tannin, et cetera, um, you know, whatever grape this is, a Nebbiolo share or something in common, um, you know, but, you know, what are the differences? Um, you know, obviously the, I think the last one didn't have any of that, you know, hair fixer thing uh, going on. Um, this is, you know, a more savory uh, kind of wine. The chat is going buck wild for Mount Etna. Yeah. Oh, wow. Really um, um, the chat is going buck wild for Mount Etna. Um, mm -hmm. That is, <laughs> I, I'm glad that, you know, we were able to utter that line in, in 2020. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, you guys are um, passing uh, with uh, flying uh, fucking colors. Uh, it should be said that uh, this was one of my, remains one of my favorite lessons we've ever done. This is uh, uh, Bonatti's uh, wine. Um, Antonio Bonatti here, uh, looking like, you know, an extra from the fucking, you know, um, Godfather or maybe, no, I mean, like uh, Scarface, maybe he looks like an extra from Scarface, but 
total badass Antonio, lovely, lovely human being, president of the DOC. Um, this was our first lesson uh, involving uh, anyone from across the pond. Um, we had uh, three uh, guests, uh, illustrious guests, um, in the mix, Alicia Von Corsi, um, Antonio, and uh, Mario Pagliuzzo um, from uh, eCustody. Um, and, you know, Italians are lovely people, but Sicilians in particular are really um, amazing. And uh, I adore this wine. Um, I adore Mount Etna. Um, and, you know, I, I love the fact that, you know, it's a wine that, you know, smells and tastes discernibly volcanic. You know, it's not a huge uh, leap of imagination to go from, you know, burnt hair to, um, you know, burnt citizens of Pompeii. Hashtag too soon. Um, all right. So um, move, moving on. Um, not <laughs> It was not, this was Suvius, it's Vesuvius, I'm sorry. Burnt citizens of Catania, uh, apologies. Um, uh, anyway, moving, <laughs> moving on, hashtag too soon. Uh, um, anyway, so uh, wine number four uh, here, wine number four. Um, you notice a distinct difference in color um, uh, for the sake of uh, wine number four versus the previous two wines. Um, and you know, it's very instructive uh, for the sake of this exercise and blind tasting. Um, I think also a discernible difference in terms of um, the play of viscosity, the play of tears uh, around the edge of the room uh, on this one. All of which points us to something that has a little more alcohol uh, to it. Uh, what do you guys get on the nose? Charred bell peppers. Charred bell peppers, yeah. Hashtag pyrazines. Like <laughs> I know what this is. Pyrazines in the hizzy. Uh, all right. Uh, Are there uh, some pencil shavings? What's uh, that? Pencil shavings, great. Yeah, great. Um, all, all of the above. What else we got? Rambly black fruits, a little black pepper too, but mm -hmm. all of the pyrazines. A little like, um, I'd say like a eucalyptus freshness to it as well as like that, that ashiness. I think it kind of, it plays both of those parts. Ooh. This is equally showing. Really, I've been, I've been impressed uh, with all this. You guys have good taste, I think is the, uh, the moral of the story. Um, you know, uh, you know, wine continues to, you know, evolve and surprise me pleasantly um, and otherwise. And, um, you know, it's always nice to take on someone else's taste and revisit the things that your friends love. So um, it's really fun to taste through these wines that were hugely popular um, over the course of our almost 40 weeks together. What are we dealing with here? What grape? I think it is a blend. I think it's a, we have a blend. Um, we've won vote for Cab Franc. Um, it is, in fact, related to Cab Franc. It's sort of a blend, Zoe. Um, uh, it is well, mostly, can you say, I think, uh, or it is mostly like, sun. Uh, oh, Zoe, what do you think it is? I think it's Asselina's Cabernet Sauvignon. That is a blend, and it does have Petit Verdot in it. It does indeed, Zoe. Nicely <laughs> done. It's uh, Nitsika Biela's uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, but it's uh, and, um, uh, and it, it, felt, it, felt, it felt like a really lovely way to close out, um, you know, our exam, um, you know, uh, we are in this, you know, really uh, rare moment for the sake of pandemic uh, that has, you know, really, you know, stripped away a lot of the, you know, kind of uh, distractions, um, you know, that, that surround us. The water uh, that David Foster Wallace, you know, once talked about in the famous commencement address and, you know, has opened our eyes to a lot of the grave inequities that exist um, in all walks of life, but particularly in the wine world. And, um, you know, the South African lesson was kind of personally hard because, you know, I'm me. Um, you know, a uh, goofy white dude, you know, trying to talk about issues of race in a country that's overwhelmingly black African, um, uh, but uh, makes a shit ton of money from a wine industry that is overwhelmingly um, white uh, African. Um, and, you know, how do you enjoy something as trivial wine as, as wine, you know, uh, in the midst of all that painful history? And I think, you know, someone like Mitsika um, points the way forward. Um, you know, this is a wine that stands on its own two feet, you know, uh, uh, Nitsiki, um, you know, is, is, you know, really want not to talk about herself as the first post-apartheid, you know, black winemaker in South Africa and, you know, just wants to talk about her, herself as a winemaker. You know, she wants the wines to stand, you know, um, you know, on their, on their own. Um, and, and my favorite thing about her is that, um, she, um, you know, the winemaking piece in Stellenbosch, um, which is a, a hugely, like, exclusive bastion of white privilege, uh, the university that she went to. Um, instruction was conducted in Afrikaans, a language not spoken in her village, um, you know, in Zululand, you know, um, worlds away um, in uh, northeastern South Africa. 
Um, so she had to, you know, conduct instruction in a language she wasn't, you know, intimately familiar with about a subject in wine she knew nothing about. You know, she just wanted to get out of the village and wine happened to be um, the way to do that. And, you know, uh, she developed a passion for it um, and she, um, you know, indulges that passion to this very day. And, um, you know, uh, we're, you know, the, the lucky beneficiaries of it all. Um, so, uh, for, you know, uh, all right, uh, without further ado, we have four wines to cover. Immediately regret regretting the, uh, the dish decision. Uh, I hope you, it sounds like you all have been, you know, incredibly impressed with the, uh, the chat. Um, uh, and uh, you guys have been called, you called these wines left and right um, uh, for the sake of, of the final exam. Um, it warms my heart, um, you know, uh, to know that, um, you know, at the very least, when tested on, you know, South African uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and um, the uh, Etna Rosas of the world, uh, you're going to rise to the occasion. Um, I don't know if you're going to make any money doing that. Um, we're certainly not making any money doing it, um, but we're excited to have you all along for the ride. Um, all right, so moving on to the, the uh, sum that will be. Um, and again, you're indulging my maximalist tendencies, um, and I apologize for the length of this lesson already. Um, uh, and we're going to, you know, uh, speed through these, um, and you can, you know, enjoy them at home. Um, we're going to go in a weird order. Um, and we're going to honor um, our good friend, uh, uh, you know, uh, the late Serge Hoshar. We're going to serve his Musar uh, last. So um, traditionally, um, this is a Lebanese wine. And Serge Hoshar, um, he served uh, his uh, uh, whites last. So whenever he tasted with them, um, I never got the chance, sadly, to taste with Serge. But um, you would taste uh, the whites after the reds, which sounds odd, but... Um, uh, Serge, uh, who is the gentleman on the right here, he was fond of saying that his biggest red wines were his whites. Uh, Mark, uh, the gentleman on the left, um, uh, joined us um, for our lesson number 24. Um, and uh, we uh, raised um, significant funds, uh, honestly, like um, several thousand dollars um, uh, through the flight uh, for Steel USA. And, and Mark was you know, hugely grateful um, that uh, you all um, contributed uh, the way you did. Um, we're going to start with uh, a wine that's stunning um, from uh, my wine crush. Actually, it should be said that, you know, I have a lot of favorite, you know, um, experiences, but um, I have to say that, like, um, Melanie uh, Fister, you know, probably one of my favorite uh, winemakers, uh, full stop. Um, the Alsatian class, um, you know, for me, it's, it's a region that I love. Um, obviously, I love Riesling, um, but um, I, the way she spoke to um, her response to the pandemic crisis, um, uh, and, and she did it in French, and it's just, it's an English cognate, um, but uh, she spoke to the spirit of resilience, um, and this idea that, you know, you're in a war-torn region in Alsace um, that has endured much over the centuries, but the vine has been, you know, one of the few constants, and she takes, um, you know, heart. Um, she finds solace um, in the progression of the seasons, uh, and in the work that she does, um, and, you know, uh, I'm ready to give all this up and, you know, <laughs> live on the land with it. Um, uh, but um, at any rate, we're trying our Pinot Gris. Uh, Pinot Gris, another one of those ruddy colored grapes. This is aged entirely in stainless. It is stupidly good. Um, uh, any thoughts, uh, Thompson, uh, on uh, the Pinot Gris, uh, given you never had it before? Sarah Thompson, come on. And I, I just poured it, sorry. You're slipping, you're slipping. Uh, Zoe's typing. You're slipping. Um, uh, it's, it's like it's she gorgeous. Looks like crushed flowers and apricots, and she's so pretty, and it's so delicious, and a lot of like apricot and white peach and um, slate and stony steel and resistance. Um, this is Melanie's kind of uh, luscious wine, um, but I, I love um, you know the the sense of of, of focus, um, purity. Um, in the mix. Uh, it's honeyed, um, it's weighty, uh, but it is, you know, sublimely balanced and just like um, hauntingly long. Um, just, just, just stupidly good. Um, uh, stupidly good. Um, she's a bit of a prodigy. She's worked with anybody who's anybody um, in Alsace, um, but you would never know. She doesn't carry herself that way. Um, and she's kind of off the beaten path. She's like at the far northern end of Alsace. Um, most of the more lauded vineyards are, are further to the south. Um, you know, uh, which is kind of consistent with our program here, but she's, she's the fucking best. Um, Can I pause to... really quickly and, and read Lisa Marie's tasting note because it's so good? Please, kick it. Honeysuckle winding around ancient rocks in a fairyland orchard. 
Fairyland. Wow. <laughs> I, I didn't, uh, I wasn't prepared for Lisa Marie's uh, Fairyland uh, reference. I feel like I should have a graphic right. for Fairyland. Um, you know, I'm imagining myself in Fairyland now, but uh, this is definitely the wine uh, I'd want to drink. Um, the second one comes from another uh, lovely uh, female winemaker, uh, Gavansa. She is uh, all the way on the right of your screen. Um, this is her rosé. Um, uh, and uh, we uh, had the pleasure of hosting her uh, for our uh, Georgia Redux, um, uh, lesson number 27. Um, uh, she makes the wines from her grapes, her sister by makes wine from uh, white grapes. Um, just a uh, really lovely rosé, but one that has like bright, uh, brambly, uh, fruited uh, component to it that, um, you know, is, is just, you know, I think super interesting. You know, um, uh, I had um, actually a, uh, um, actually had a, a request for a, a wine flight based around um, Harry Styles songs. And this one reminds me a little bit of Watermelon. What's the Watermelon song? Watermelon something? Sugar? Watermelon Sugar? Um, yeah, yeah. So this is like the Watermelon Sugar uh, of wines. Um, and it appeals to me it's rosé because there's like something gender, you know, fluid about rosé that feels very Harry Styles. So um, uh, you're drinking a Georgian wine that's like the Harry Styles of wine, um, which is you know, never a bad thing. Um, uh, at any rate, um, uh, I, I love what she does. Um, uh, it's by her sister uh, was on the left of the photo that I, I unshared. Um, you know, this reminds me a little bit of like Chinon uh, rosé. Um, so it's a little cat bronchi. Um, I think uh, this is actually not uh, raised in Cabernet, so this is uh, just pure stainless, uh, more modern uh, wine making. Uh, it smells like Capri Sun. Uh, which 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 Capri Sun packet, uh, Sarah Thompson? That's fair. Tropical. <laughs> was it trop I thought it was a tropical wine. I didn't think there was just a single tropical flavor. Oh, it reminds me a little bit of the. Pardon me, I'm going to Google. <laughs> it reminds me a little bit of the, um, like Starburst had these rogue flavors that were like the tropical flavors and they had like a strawberry kiwi. Um, they were always like lesser than flavors than the originals, but this is a little bit like the strawberry kiwi. No, Capri Sun had a tropical punch, but there is a strawberry kiwi tropical, or oh, yeah. strawberry kiwi Capri Sun. Okay, okay. Well, I mean, that, that's the one I'm going all in on. But uh, tropical punch, uh, we'll go with it. Uh, nicely done. Um, uh, any other thoughts uh, about this wine? I also love um, how uh, kind of astute and uh, innovative um, the sisters are, uh, Gavance and Baia. They're very much rooted um, in the traditions of their country, Georgia. It's the most ancient winemaking country um, in the world, but um, really like on point, their branding, their marketing, I can love the label of this wine. Um, this actually is a new label. Um, and uh, you see it's actually Kevevery uh, there. She's kind of like uh, draped on the side of, um, and, you know, they use social media, you know, uh, and I was talking talk, talk to Melanie about this, like, you know, being a winemaker these days, you know, you're not just a winemaker, you know, you're a brand ambassador um, in, a, in a particular way. And, and, you know, I think they take that on um, in a really like fluid and, you know, kind of elegant uh, way that I, that I think. Um, any other thoughts about this wine from the commentariat, uh, uh, Sarah, or are you just continuing to research Capri Sun flavors? <laughs> I really like Heidi's um, comment that it has that like white pepper kick to it um, as well. Go. It definitely has that pizzazz within the acidity that just um, shines right through and carries the palate all the way to the finish. It's just gorgeous. I love everything that the I love that. I'm, great. I'm grateful that Heidi has recovered from uh, her uh, Thursday night cocktail tasting. Uh, when... <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Heidi. Uh, we love you. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, moving, moving on. Um, uh, that was Dolores, bad. Dolores Cabrera Fernandez. Uh, so I get to try out my Spanish accent. So, um, you know, uh, this is a, a bit of a mea culpa. Um, so uh, I regret that, um, uh, you know, uh, we did a first uh, live event to benefit Mama Toto, and it was fucking awesome. You know, one of my favorite memories of the year. Um, and, and thank you to everyone who came out for it. Uh, but uh, I, I gave up a topic that I, I thought only worked in person because the wines are relatively arcane, but it's something that um, now you all have come to embrace. And I, I should have, you know, shared with the broader audience, it's Canary Islands. Um, so uh, this is a wine from Tenerife, from Pico de Taide. Um, it's actually from the Val de Orotavo, um, kind of north and east of uh, the Pico. It's one of the largest uh, volcanoes, one of the largest mountains actually in the world from the sea floor to the top of it. Um, uh, this is basically like the Beaujolais Nouveau of, um, of Canary Island wine. It's a new wine. Uh, for all of you at home. 
Uh, and uh, it's like crunchy and, you know, uh, savory and has a little bit of that, like, you know, uh, Aetna volcanic, um, you know, burn vacuum cleaner belt charm, uh, but in this delightfully juicy way that I, I'm, you know, absolutely adoring. Um, from 100 plus year old vines, it's stupid. Nobody makes, you know, nouveau uh, equivalents from 100 plus year old vines. Um, I, I, I've been, I've been really impressed with it. Uh, any, any thoughts from the folks at home? So I, uh, no, everybody wants just to do a, um, like an after party class. Everybody wants to have a post vaccination, post COVID in, oh. in person party. I'm, I'm, cool. I'm all for that. We have a lot of wine around. So if you guys just want to hang on, then, um, I have nowhere to be. Um, uh, at any rate. I was that Ed and Heather are right. They thought you were going to troll them with Sutter home. And I was like, yeah, I agree. <laughs> oh, in the, in this, in this context of wine tasting. Yeah. I'm sorry I didn't think of that, guys. Uh, that would have been amazing. Um, it should be said that I've done that to staff before. Um, I have done that to staff before um, and, and actually done that various different ways for staff. So I've thrown in Southern Home into a rosé tasting. I've thrown in Yellowtail Chardonnay in a Chardonnay tasting. I've made them taste uh, a flight of wines red and rosés uh, with the color altered. Um, and uh, what else have done is torturous. Um, uh, I, 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 I'm You're not explaining the biggest thing that you do, which is for That's every right. single um, FOH staff member who comes on, you get all of these amazing one-on-one -on -one classes with Bill. And at tasting them, he will render um, alcohol into um, all the different structures of wine, which means that he will um, chop to lie something and he'll give you some oh, yeah, vodka that is on, have sugar in it. But that also means that you're going to drink some vodka with all of the acid in it. And then you're putting what? How much citric acid in per yeah. bottle? It's a uh, lot. I, I think but the it, worst, the worst I did, I forget was maybe it was, I was alley actually next door. So someone said a wine smelled like witch hazel. Uh, so, or alley did. Hazel in a wine, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> all right moving on moving on moving on uh this is like me as the uh older brother that i am for <laughs> uh, remember that one time that you free formed and like threw a bunch of vodka in <laughs> That's right, moving on. we're moving on we're moving on um uh final line here uh 2013 obi de miroir blend obi de miroir are supposedly um indigenous uh, native varietals to lebanon um, uh, living on the ancient world, so it's, it's hard to dispute that claim, uh, but there are, you know, uh, individuals who say that they are very strictly related to Chardonnay and Semillon. Um, at any rate, um, this is a nerdy wine, uh, hugely oxidative in terms of the, the style, um, at elevation um, in uh, the Becca Valley of Lebanon. Um, it is, you know, something to chew over. Uh, it is a wine, you know, uh, that, you know, again, Maybe not your first love, um, but, you know, maybe something uh, to grow with. And, and, you know, I hope, too, that, you know, for the sake of these lessons, um, that, you know, you have spent enough time with wine that, you know, it has ceased to be purely, um, you know, a subjective phenomenon and, and become something that, you know, evaluate a little more analytically. And, you know, I find often, you know, the things that you spend time with, you know, your first love is not your last. Um, you know, uh, you know, you don't, uh, you know, always listen to k-pop eventually you graduate to bach or something or um maybe it's a terrible analogy but you know uh, you move on and i remember my first wine in in wine love was like california meritage blend fucking like turley's in um and you know now i drink you know moussard blanc so um you know what you love at first isn't always you know uh what you spend your your life with um and that's okay case of all um and i think that says something profound about you know the wines or the people um, that you ultimately choose um, to make a bigger part of your life uh, as you as you grow older. So uh, I'm going to open up to all the questions, but um, uh, we've taken a uh, long ass time. Uh, and I have one more bonus poem uh, for you all here to close things out. Um, this is a poem that I shared, ball drop of uh, 2019 into uh, 2020. Uh, it is from uh, W.S. Merwin, who actually passed away in 2019. Uh, and it seemed very fitting uh, to... Uh, close out uh, this year with it. Uh, so, with what stillness at last you peer in the valley, 
your first sunlight reaching down to touch the tips of a few high leaves that do not stir as though they had not noticed and do not know you at all. Then the voice of a dove calls from far away in itself to the hush of the morning. So this is the sound of you here and now, whether or not anyone hears it. This is where we have come with our age, our knowledge such as it is, and our hopes such as they are invisible before us, untouched and still possible. Um, and you know, my hope for this year is that um, in spite of the pain um, you know, that uh, it, it has uh, forced upon us all, in spite of the dislocation it has enforced upon us all, that you know, not unlike you know, a magical realist novel, it hasn't opened up uh, a world of possibilities for us all. And uh, this being uh, you know, first and foremost, among them and you know I thank you uh, for this um, and I thank you for uh, continuing uh, to join us uh, so many weeks on and uh, I'm going to toast you all as I customarily do but there's only one way I could do it. Getting very meta, drinking from the motherfucking bottle. Cheers to you all at home alone together. Woo! Yeah. I'll wake you up in the morning. Uh, delightful. Um, What's the that, alcohol content? That is actually, uh, so, so um, I should say that I think that is actually the watermelon, watermelon sugar wines. Uh, I, 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 I feel like Harry Styles needs a Sutter Home endorsement deal. Um, so it's, uh, um, it should be said that uh, Sutter Home actually initially resulted from a stuck ferment. Um, so it was a happy accident. It was like the penicillin of wines. It was like, you know, this mold growing in a wine vat, you know, could cure someone. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what Sutter Home cures people of, but at any rate. Um, uh, so stuck ferment is when uh, the uh, sugar is not fully fermented in a wine and it stays sweet. Um, so this is a bit like Cabinet Riesling, though. Um, so it's only uh, nine and a half percent alcohol. Um, that said, so which is to say that, you know, you should be able to drink a decent amount of it and not get totally like hung over in the morning. Um, I have no idea what else is in this wine. Um, you know, it is uh, a mass produced, um, you know, kind of uh, alcoholic soda. Um, so, you know, that, you know, those adulterants could definitely, you know, um, contribute to one's uh, hangover, uh, you know, after the fact. But it does make a delightful Coke event, um, uh, it should be said. Um, the set of home. So, uh, cheers, cheers to you all, uh, whatever you're drinking at home. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, from the commentary, uh, I should be said, I, I had a sp special request, um, uh, pertaining to uh, a bit of verse, um, from our, uh, our front window. So, um, in addition to, uh, two front teeth, uh, three former hosts and 19 bottles of wine consumed over the course of, uh, the year, we are, uh, plus one on a beautiful mural um, outside of our Revelers Hour uh, restaurant. Um, and uh, local artist Alon Parker um, contributed that, that mural. Um, and uh, there's a, a quote um, at the top uh, that uh, reads, uh, they, uh, they thought uh, they were uh, burying us. They didn't know they were planting seeds, um, which has uh, kind of uh, come uh, become, you know, a bit of a motto for a lot of uh, social justice and, you know, um, Black Lives Matter concerns, uh, but certainly not limited to, to Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, uh, it's been adopted by, you know, a lot of social justice oriented uh, movements um, uh, over the course of, you know, the last decade or so. Um, and uh, I actually thought it was a, an ancient Greek saying, and it has kind of the wisdom of the ancients uh, to it, but it's actually a, a, a newer uh, saying, uh, and it derives um, from a uh, couplet um, from a Greek poet. Um, uh, he initially dropped it in a, uh, a, a work called The Body and the Wormwood. Um, uh, Dinos uh, Christianopoulos, um, he was gay and uh, as such um, was shunned by um, a lot of his fellows in uh, the Greek literary community. And um, that was kind of the inspiration uh, for this particular line. But the original line reads, uh, what didn't you do to bury me but you forgot that I was a seed. Um, and that was in 1978. Um, the first English translation was in 1995. And it's become a, a bit of a social justice motto. Um, and, you know, we're thrilled to have it on our window to this, to this very day. And uh, big ups uh, again to uh, Lisa Marie for, you know, um, kind of inspiring uh, that deeper dive uh, for the sake of uh, our artwork. Uh, what do you got, Zoe? 
Um, what is the underrated wine that you think will become like the next it girl for 2021? Ooh, 2020, 2021 it girl. What is um, the Queen's Gambit of the wine world circa 2021? Um, I have no fucking idea. So yeah, <laughs> uh, if I if I knew that, I would be way wealthier than I am. Um, uh, and I feel like I, there's not a lot of money to be gained, made in the wine, uh, um, you know, if you're all game. Um, you know, I feel like White Claw is, you know, cleaning up at the bank. Uh, wine isn't. Um, wine, it girl, 2021. Oh, shit. Um, I, I mean, it, it's hard to, like, is, like, orange wine and it, it girl, Georgian wine and it girl, it's Canary Island wine and it girl. Um, you know, whose it girl are we talking about? Is it my it girl? Is it, like, the general public's it girl? Um, you know, uh, 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 I, don't I, think know. I think it's general public it girl. General, general public, general public. So what was, how about this though? What will you, what, what, what do people think like the 2020, uh, it girl was for the sake of, for the sake of wine? I, I'd like to say, say that I have my finger on the pulse of that, but you know, I don't really trade in wine it girls. Um, you know, so what I feel like, you know, Sabi B was the new Pinot Gris, um, uh, you know, what is the new Pinot Gris? Like, uh, maybe, maybe let's, how about like Albarino? I could see Albarino taking off again. Although I feel like Albarino had a moment and then like lost a moment. Um, you need to think about like supply side things though, in terms of people being able to turn out a shit ton of wine to sate, uh, public demand in a particular way. Um, it's not going to basically like, I'm trying to think in terms of the things that I don't regularly drink. Um, because usually it's like the, the stuff that I don't like that becomes, uh, or not, not that I don't like, or, um, I'm trying to think of like negative space. Um, maybe Ber Berdejo is a good it, it girl wine, you know, it's kind of like showy. Um, and Spain, you know, is always agreeable in terms of vintages. Um, actually, how about this? I, I think I, I, I would see, here's a favorable, here's a good it girl. Here's a good it girl. Uh, the good it girl is, uh. Uh, not me making wine. People that are not me making wine. So non non white dudes making wine. I, I hope I hope that is the it girl. Um, I hope I hope the it girl is a girl. Um, and preferably, you know, um, yeah, yeah, a girl that you know traditionally you know wouldn't get into wine. Um, and and I will say that like hopefully platforms like this lower the barriers to entry to people. And you know I think that whole moment of like walking into a restaurant, walking to a wine store, walking into a, a winery and feeling out of place, you know, feeling like, you know, shit, I don't belong in this room. You know, I think like virtually those barriers erode uh, a lot more um, in a really awesome way. And I, I just hope that, you know, in the wine community, people will, you know, acknowledge the fact that A, taste is hugely subjective and you shouldn't, you know, hate on anyone for liking what they like. I mean, uh, it, that's not to say that, you know, it's not important to make wine in a way that doesn't, you know, defile, uh, you know, the soil and the environment for future generations. But there are a lot of different ways to make socially responsible wine, you know, to appeal to different tastes. And, you know, we should be leaning into that, not, you know, um, you know, kind of like, you know, prescribing a particular, you know, set of wines for people to drink. And then also, too, I'd love to see, um, you know, I'd love to see like a community of astute, you know, wine drinkers evolve that doesn't depend on a certifying regime, you know, like the court or, or depends on a better certifying regime. Um, you know, I, I, the, the WSEC community is actually really lovely. Um, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, this, this notion of, um, you know, a few, um, you know, kind of guardians of the trade you know, needs to die a quick death, and it is, but, you know, it always takes longer than it should for the dinosaurs to collapse. C, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, what else we got? Uh, what were the top um, sellers in the wine shop, and what surprised you as a top seller in the wine shop that you didn't think was going to be so good? Uh, excellent question, bingo. Um, so, um, uh, it should be said that the uh, Bla Francish was a huge seller in a way that I didn't uh, expect. Um, actually, John House's wines uh, did really well. 
um, in a way that I didn't expect. Um, he was, <laughs> he's kind of an interesting, <laughs> interesting personality. I love him to death, but John is like, uh, like hugely nerdy and kind of a very straight white male kind of way. Um, not that I don't have those tendencies myself, but, you know, just in a, you know, um, expert on all things uh, kind of way that turns some people off. Um, but I think the wines are awesome. Uh, and and they're, they're kind of like loud Rieslings. Um, and I didn't think everybody would be into that. But people were like hugely into it. I continue to be impressed that, you know, people are willing to like follow me on these flights of fancy. So uh, the demand for Canary Island wine, um, you know, continues to um, proceed apace. Um, it'd be really amazing. It should be said that uh, in uh, the mailer, so it's my hope um, to uh, distribute a mailer tomorrow and we'll have a link to all the wines that were in the tasting today, along with a 10% off uh, code, hashtag excellent questions uh, for those of you to uh, fulfill uh, and cross off, you know, those last minute, you know, kind of, uh, you know, wine uh, gifts. Um, but uh, I'm hoping also to send out an invite uh, for our next lesson featuring Philippa Pato, arguably like the most prominent winemaker uh, we featured uh, on um, the Tail Up Goat uh, Wine School. Um, the, the, honestly, the demand for the Georgian stuff has been really, has been really awesome. Um, I'm trying to think of other, Zoe, can you think of other, uh, having yourself worked at the wine, wine shop for, I should pull the number. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Canary nice. Islands, absolutely. Say what? Oh, all of our Canary Islands wine. Has there been anything that you didn't like that you were, <laughs> that you were like, fuck, I, I'm, I didn't think I would have to reorder this, but I, but I did. No. Um. I think we, neither of us like really buy anything that we don't want to sell or that we're not excited about. Yeah, this is good. Yeah, this is wines that like aren't our favorites, but um, but certainly like not bad. And I think that you and I both come from like, and Sarah as well, like a point where it's like, you know, if there's a, like the Zorzal Malbec, for example, like I'm I love that one. Going to like, I will say, yeah, down so buy an Argentine Malbec, but like that's a fucking amazing Malbec. I, I, so, um, and, and it's been a real gift for me as a wine nerd to have the excuse to take on these kind of different perspectives. And, you know, I was a Latin American history major, but um, I had this like really tenuous relationship with Latin American wine. Um, and Malbec has this like really hugely fascinating history coming from the old world to the new um, that involves, you know, Argentine luminaries like Diego Sarmiento that I spent the bulk of my um, uh, not degree generating undergraduate days, um, you know, learning about. And, um, it, it was super cool to, you know, discover those anew and, and honestly to like realize that, um, there are, um, all these, uh, really amazing, you know, thoughtful younger producers, um, making, uh, really, you know, elegant wine in places not commonly associated with it. Uh, Thompson, uh, for you sake, there are any wines that you were surprised, um, you know, kind of, uh, took on a life of their own for the sake of sales? Oh gosh, I don't know. It's been since what August? Oh uh, come um, on. I don't know. I don't think so. But people in the chat are talking about Lambrusco a lot. Oh yeah. So uh, I had this whole, so I had this whole idea of inviting back like uh, <laughs> uh, old guest stars for the sake of this lesson, and and thankfully I did away with it because um, my sense of time is terrible. Um, uh, I'm sure that will come as a surprise to no one. Um, I was building out the, the, the flights, um, and, uh, um, uh, our very own, uh, Ali Thorgren, who's the, uh, wine guru at Tail Goat, uh, was talking about Bill's plan for something. And she said, isn't that an oxymoron? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, Allie was in a particularly salty mood, it should be said, and she's going to, uh, Hawaii to, uh, you know, bruh. <laughs> to cleanse some of the salt, but yeah, it has been a long year uh, and good honor. And we, we love, we love her for the salt. Um, I didn't like, we don't, it should be said we don't hire sycophants and uh, like one of like, I, I, you know, I don't, I, I want to be challenged uh, by the people I work with. I don't, I don't want to be, um, you know, kind of parroted uh, at, at any rate. Um, uh, I don't know where the hell I was going with that, Sarah. Uh, yeah, I was going to say you hired Zoe. So, uh, totally, totally, <laughs> I totally lost that train of thought. I, I'm a glutton. These salty people who... I, I, no, I, I hired you both because I'm a glutton for punishment, clearly. Uh, <laughs> um, but that, that said, because you've now brought up Allie, people would very much like to see Allie in these chats in the new year. Allie's, uh, Allie's working, guys. Allie's, Allie's, Allie's uh, 
making yeah. that. But on Sunday right. nights, people want to see Allie. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Uh, we would, we would, we would like to see you all. Uh, but uh, you know, back switching back to uh, you know RC Malbec. You know, it, it, it's fun to have you know this like bigger universe of wines to play with and you know take on perspectives that you wouldn't take on otherwise and find a great Argentine Malbec. And it reinforced my notion that you know there are you know there's no region you can totally write off. You know, you can't say you know you can't make good wine in insert place here. You know, even if they're not currently doing it, you know, a lot of places just need time. Um, and, you know, even if, you know, there's a lot of shitty wine from a place, you know, there's always, you know, some hipster teenager making, you know, and doing something cool. You know, there's always an exception to the rule. And, and I think, you know, it's really important uh, to, to remember that, you know, uh, when, when you're drinking wine, uh, to, you know, embrace the mystery of it all and prepare to be surprised uh, in, you know, really pleasant, you know, kinds of, kinds of ways. Um, another thing I meant to mention, so uh, uh, I had... Uh, multiple requests um, for uh, a compilation of poems uh, from our lessons. Uh, and that was actually something I'm, I was really excited to do. Um, and then uh, the clock struck uh, like one o'clock today. And uh, uh, thanks again, time management, um, I realized that it wasn't going to happen, but it will happen uh, by tomorrow. Um, uh, if you scan the, the card and, and big up to Matthew Ramsey for designing our special uh, Tail Up Goat holiday greeting, but if you scan this currently, uh, you see a link to the uh, uh, New Year poem uh, that uh, I read to, to close things out today. Uh, but if you scan it uh, at some point tomorrow, uh, you'll see a link to all the poems. Um, very exciting. Very exciting. Uh, and I'll distribute that as a, a file through the magic of Dropbox. Um, and it's crazy to me that I'm as fluent with all these um, cloud sharing platforms as I, as I am. Uh, Zoe, what else you got? Um, what are you going to be drinking for New Year's Eve? Uh, I haven't thought, Zoe, I haven't thought that far. Uh, we're taking it day by day um, at the uh, at the Jensen Broadbeck, uh, Jensen, Seibert, um, Tyler uh, households. Um, so um, New Year's Eve, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I will say that my favorite New Year's Eve was, the, so, you know, as someone in the service industry, I don't expect to, like really have a new year's you know you just work new year's fine but it's not something that you like deify um my favorite new year's was uh, uh my wife and i before the restaurant opened uh i ha actually had the night off and cooked this like lamb ragu in the slow cooker it was awesome drank uh what did we do? We had, like barola or something um uh but you know fell asleep watching pitbulls rocking new year um and then woke up just in time to see pitbull drop the ball and Nobody drops a ball like Pitbull. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, like one of my favorite New Year's memories, like, uh, you know, falling asleep, waking up. Um, but this New Year's, I don't know. I've been leaning to champagne lately uh, since we did uh, the champagne class. Um, it's an expensive habit, but, you know, it's nice to be able to buy things at um, wholesale. And, I, you know, I'm still in this, like, um, kind of post-apocalyptic Mad Max. What does it all mean? I might as well drink my feelings uh, place. Um, so, um, I feel like Mad Max would like champagne if he had access to it. Um, so, uh, I'll probably drink champagne. Uh, it's cliche, but it's a worthwhile one. Um, and you know, it, it additionally is, is one of my favorite lessons, uh, if only because of all the, um, you know, circumstance surrounding it. And because I was hugely worried that I like totally fucked things up for the world, uh, by calling shots before, uh, the election for the sake of, for the sake of the lesson. Um, not that, you know, um, my merest proclaiming of champagne, champagne as lesson can, you know, influence electoral outcomes, but, you know, there's this like quantum physics, you know, butterfly wing flapping thing that happens occasionally. And, you know, we try not to tempt fate, especially when it comes to orange clowns in the White House. So, uh, what else you got? Uh, what was your most excellent, excellent question you've received? Ooh. Oh, um, that's actually, I do know, I do know. Um, so we got a question about um, the Finger Lakes lesson. Um, and we got a question about um, the um, life cycle of particular grape varieties and uh, the sexing of particular grapes. So um, there, there's some, some grape varietals um, uh, depend um, for um, their flowering um, on they're 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 not self flowering they you know they're like male and female and we got a question about that and and it was like very deep 
it was like, if it was, a, again, just to, to mention like Dave Foster Wallace, it would be like, you know, the infinite jest, like footnotes, like buried in the footnotes. Um, but it was a great, like, it was like, dear God, um, you know, uh, you know, this community has grown around me that is asking about, <laughs> the, you know, the, the reproductive lives of great vines, you know, I can hang it up now. I've done, you know, I've, I've done my good in this world. Um, so that, I think that was like the most excellent question. Um, but you know, they're, I think they're, they're all, they're all excellent questions. And, and again, like when it comes to anything in life, like approaching it with the, you know, joy of a, a child asking all the questions is what makes life worth living. Um, what will you be drinking on inauguration day? And will you curate a, Oh, shit. So I, I, had to leave, I had to leave off with this. And my, my mom and dad actually like uh, were were wondering, um, and you never want to keep mom and dad wondering. Uh, but there will be wine school in the new world. So um, uh, it should be said, um, uh, uh, there's going to be a wine school winter break. Um, uh, sadly, there's no J term. Unless Sarah, do you want to do a J term for? <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, Sarah will do her own J term with the cats as pupils. Uh, <laughs> um, but they're, they're, the the uh, 2021, uh, we're all we're all going to give our livers a chance to recover. Um, although the livers the liver is evil and must be destroyed. But um, uh, at any rate. Uh, uh, we're going to take, we're going to take a little time off, uh, after lesson 40, uh, but we're going to come back strong, uh, the weekend of inauguration. Um, and, uh, we're going to go from there, honestly. I, I don't know, um, uh, you know, what, uh, shape or form this is, is going to take going forward. I'm hugely grateful we've been able to, um, you know, propagate this whole thing as long as we have. I never imagined that, uh, it would endure as long as it had, uh, has, um, um, and, and, you know, something that, you know, can't stop, won't stop. Um, but it'll be a little different in, in 2021. Um, uh, but, um, you know, uh, hopefully it'll be different in like a, a new and unexpected and embrace the possibilities kind of way. Uh, but yes, we'll definitely do something for the Biden inauguration. Um, it's going to revolve, I can already tell you, around his vice president, uh, Biden. Uh, I love him to death. Um, Amtrak Joe for Life um, is a teetotaler. Um, and we're going to honor his uh, vice president, who is uh, not a teetotaler. Uh, she gets her drink on, uh, and we love her. Uh, so, um, yeah, we're going to do a, a California lesson in honor of her girl. Yeah. Uh, what is the most um, unusual ob object that you've used to savor a bottle of wine? Uh, none, none. Uh, mostly shitty knives from the kitchen. I've never gotten broke with it. Um, I, I know people do, and I was actually contemplating, um, uh, uh, I've actually contemplated, uh, I uh, like savoring uh, Magnum for the sake of this lesson, but uh, Sutter Home just felt like the right way to go out. Um, uh, and you can put that on my tombstone. Sutter Home just felt like the right way to go out. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, um, uh, I, 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 I've, never, I've never explored the space. It, you guys both raised your hand. Have you explored the space for the sake of savoring? 1,000%, yes. Uh, what, what, have you, what is the most interesting object to you? Keep it PG. So I passed my certified exam and was living in North Carolina working on that vineyard. And I had all of two friends and we went into the basement of this wine shop of a friend who was opening a wine shop there in the middle of nowhere, North Carolina, but we didn't have a knife. Um, and so there was a very flimsy metal ruler. Oh, nice. Um, it took me about 15 times Oh, you took 15 times? Yeah, it took about 15 times. It, what it, was the, it wasn't working, it wasn't working, it wasn't working, and then it finally worked. Fascinating. Um, what, what, it was embarrassing. I was like, <laughs> come on! <laughs> I swear this never happens to me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, I did it! No? I mean, I did it! <laughs> never, never, this never, this never, this never, just give me a couple moments. Uh, yeah, I'm really distracted. <laughs> I have a lot of stress. Uh, what else, Zoe, what is the most? A uh... Um, uh, dear friend of mine, she finally got a new phone this year. She was rocking her iPhone 4 until 2020. And so I, I taught her how to savor a bottle of champagne with her old iPhone 4. Whoa! <laughs> That's awesome. amazing. That's awesome. Did it, did it uh, injure the, the old iPhone 4? Or was iPhone 4 like... 
No, um, phone totally intact. Uh, RIP Steve Jobs would have been so proud of the craftsmanship um, <laughs> and the clean break. It was like one of the best saberings I've ever seen from wow you know, sabering for their first time. That was beautiful. wow. Wow, someone paying the ghost of Steve Jobs. If she's like, can I just say that Wendy, <laughs> Wendy is saying that she savored a bottle with a car key on a hike. Oh, uh, that's gangster. Yes. I, I like, can't even imagine that. That's so yeah. impressive. Yeah. Well, yeah. Good. Good on you guys. Uh, just you know, just yes. keep it safe when you're sabering at home. Keep it. Keep it. Keep it. Keep it safe. Keep it safe. Uh, what else, you guys? All right. Um, would you consider doing a class about mead? Fascinating. Me, I actually find mead hugely fascinating. It should be said, um, my dog walker makes mead. And that's a really weird, my dog walker makes mead is just a weird sentence. Um, feels like a, like a death cat song or something. Um, but uh, um, <laughs> mead is, mead's fascinating. Mead, mead, like honey is fascinating. Mead is ancient. I feel like I like uh, should like, I mean, I definitely know that like when I do the mead lesson, we're doing a reading from Beowulf. That just feels right. Um, in the original Old English, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, great. I get on more. Like there are all sorts. Of, like, mead is fascinating too. There are all these like like mead sub variants. Um, uh, you actually like mead doesn't ferment. Obviously, you have to add like water to mead. Like uh, mead mead scares me. Like I, I feel like I I don't understand. You know, after all these years of you know, drinking wine, I, I, I still am trying to wrap my head around it. I, I don't want to take on another fermentable, um, you know, and, and I feel that way about sake in particular, you know, and, and sake is this weird, like, double stage fermentation process. Mead, mead's kind of the same way, but, like, mead is, is as, like, even more ancient in its own way than, than, than wine, um, you know, so I, I think mead could be fun. I actually thought about the, the one class that I really wanted to do, I haven't done yet is cider. Um, fucking love cider, um, and would love to do a cider class, um, and, and you probably will at some point. Um, uh, you know, just like uh, I'm, I'm excited to find new and different ways to do all this shit. Um, you know, I, I absolutely adore it. Um, you know, it's been, um, you know, it's been a grind for the sake of um, the, the every Sunday scheduling. So, you know, I'd love to find a way that um, you know gives me the occasional. Uh, you know, Sunday at home as much as I love you all. Um, and, and, you know, just make it, make it like, you know, workable for the life of business as opposed to something that, you know, is more of an emergency uh, response, but, you know, um, to sustain, you know, the same community and, and you know, uh, give people a way to, um, you know, access not only the, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the mead, the cider, the wine is, is, you know, important, but, you know, the, the coming together piece is, is, is more important. Awesome. Um, I have a really good question that I think should be the last question. So if oh, okay, okay, any okay. other questions in between, can anybody uh, DM me right now or put it in the chat? We'll just buy time for a few seconds. <laughs> Sarah Thompson, do you have any questions? Can we just hang out? <laughs> can you just like, un can you just, like unmute everyone <laughs> yeah. right, we're at a critical mass where if you want to chime in then uh <laughs> you know and actually i think we're sufficiently deep and that uh you know and actually this is the we are at the latest uh we're going on uh, an hour and 40 on this so if you want to unmute yourselves i give you that you've, you've been uh you've been <laughs> yeah. I, I give you the i give you the blessing yeah yeah, yeah. Um, Bill, what was uh, lessons learned in 2020, whether in wine class or oh, not? Christ. It should be a popcorn to Sarah as well. Lessons learned, Jesus. Um, where to start? Um, I, I don't know. I um, like a, I mean, been, I'm sure it's been surreal for everyone. Um, personally, um, you know, I, I felt. Uh, huge responsibility to um you know the the staff of our restaurants and um you know the community of people that um we you know provide food and drink and you know a sense of shared ownership over something with um you know but that's all balanced with 
you know, all sorts of stuff that happens here on a personal level. So, you know, how do you balance a business that's all consuming with a life at home and, you know, how you do that in the best of times and, you know, how you do that in the midst of this. And, um, you know, I, I think that for, for me, like, uh, hopefully it's, it's, it's been a lesson learned in terms of writing your own story and, you know, um, embracing unexpected, um, you know, opportunities as they arise and not being afraid to, you know, lean into the things, um, you know, that, that you love in unexpected ways and, um, you know, to, to run with it all and, you know, to, to, to declare that. And, um, you know, I, I hope that, um, you know, something that I'm able to continue to do. And honestly, like, um, I'm, you know, at this point in my, my restaurant life, you know, as much as I love service, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, um, you know, at a point where I'd, I'd rather do this and, um, you know, appear on the floor a couple, couple nights a week and, um, you know, make that my, my work a day. And, um, I think, uh, I would hope that, you know, for, for people at home, you know, uh, the pandemic has a way of stripping things away and, um, you know, making you reconsider, you know, what, what is truly important to you? You know, what do you truly love about what you do? And, you know, how do you want to apply that going forward in the best possible way? And, and, you know, um, you know, I, I hope to live with that going forward. That was, that was, a, that was tough. Okay. That was tough. <laughs> was that my mom or my <laughs> wife? And <laughs> 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 did the dog did the did BD did the dog invade the chat? Uh, she definitely she definitely wants. So actually, uh, we joke that the dog is living her best life. Um, the, the dog definitely like wants twenty twenty to continue. Um, the dog is like the the twenty twenty like contrarian um, uh, in the, in our midst. But uh, no, I, I do I equally hope too that like um, you know the. You know, I've read as much. I'm not. It's not an original thought, but you know, pandemic has accelerated a lot of technological and societal changes that were already in their midst. So, you know, what we're doing now was something that was available to people, but people weren't readily um, taking advantage of. And and you know, obviously, you know, we're not going to do it as much because, you know, virtual happy hours. You know, they're. I'd rather, I'd rather actually be at. I'd rather be at a fucking bar. You know, but uh, <laughs> but you know, by the same token, I, I hope that. You know, we don't, you know, totally um, abandon this. And, you know, I hope, you know, we are more comfortable, you know, with engaging one another this way because, you know, that equally there's magic in it. And, like, I, I just, I, I think about, like, you know, the Gavances of the world, you know, the, the, the Marks of the world, the Antonias of the world, you know, being able to connect with someone like eight times on way and have them talk about their wine. Like, you know, I, I think about that in a, a lot in the context of, um, you know, so we, we live in this, you know, political, social, environmental moment where things can feel really compromised and fucked up. But by the same token, we have access to this godlike technology that, um, you know, allows us to live our lives in ways that, you know, were previously unimagined. So, um, uh, you know, if we have to deal with the pain of all other shit, we might as well embrace the joy of this. Amen. Well said. Well said. Um, if you were great, what would you be? <laughs> Ooh, is, that last, is that the last question? Um, that's a great question. Actually, uh, we should so we we it should be said we we have used this as a restaurant icebreaker before. So, um, as a former political organizer, uh, community organizer, I'm a huge believer in the icebreaker. Love a good icebreaker. Um, love making people feel awkward about it. A good icebreaker. Um, one of my favorite holiday icebreakers, like favorite holiday movie, uh, favorite holiday album. Uh, you name it, because obviously I have many. Um, but um, if I was a grape, I, I mean, I'd be Riesling. Um, uh, you know, it, it just, it's just it's it's just where I land. Um, you know, it, it's it's versatile. It's very white. <laughs> uh, you know, it is uh, a wine that's you know not hugely alcoholic, but you know can be you know tremendously durable um, and you know even eternal. Um, well, not eternal. Nobody's eternal, but you know, live for a long time. And, and um, you know, it is it's just kind of multifaceted and expressive of place. And um, it's also like, I like that Riesling like is equally fun. So you can have like flirty, you know, 
Um, you know, you have Rieslings that drink like, you know, Sutter Home. Um, and then and then you have Rieslings that are just like as every bit as serious and complex as you could want a wine to be. And and I love what's not to love about a grape that embraces that duality. Sarah, what was, um, what's your varietal? Oh my God. <laughs> I think when we did this in Icebreakers, I was like, I, I felt like I was Chenin Blanc, but that's just because that's my favorite grape varietal. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, so, so is this like the, uh, what grape would you want to be versus what grape? Yeah, right. You, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I can be sweet, but I can also be dry. <laughs> You're beautiful just the way you are, Sarah Thompson. <laughs> I can take on age gracefully. <laughs> <laughs> or I can taste really sour. <laughs> I'm a little wooly. <laughs> well, come on, so Shannon, Shannon's your answer? Yeah, <laughs> I just gave you all my, all my reasons why. <laughs> I thought you were going to follow up with the grape you actually are. Like, you, <laughs> like I actually, I, I wanted to be Shannon Blanc, but I'm actually like Guy Blanc. Yeah. Or, <laughs> actually. But I feel like that's true about my personality. I can be sweet and also very dry. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I age gracefully, but I like, Shannon, you know. I think I'm Shannon's sorry. great. I feel good about Shannon for you, Thompson. I think Thank Shannon's great. Uh, Zoe? Um, I think it's like Syrah, uh, like Syrah can I feel be like found in like places. I feel like you should be like Italian an, though. I feel like, I don't know, I, I feel like you should be Italian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, sure, following Gina. No. <laughs> Definitely. No. <laughs> no, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like Zoe's Nebbiolo or something. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I feel like you gave a Nebbiolo as you, you give a Nebbiolo as your answer previously for this. She's got structure and power, you know, and, and very dynamic. Yeah. Different. Yeah, she's types. like the, you're like the Barbaresco to the Barolo. You're like the Gaia. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> you're the queen. Absolutely. 1997 Gaia. Full circle. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? What was it? Uh, I'm forgetting. The quote was uh, um, a grown, grown and sexy, grown and grown, grown and sexy. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> Bill. Yes. It's, uh, it's Jill over here. Uh, yes, yes. Um, just thought you should know. I don't. I don't really think Zoe's much of a Nebbiolo. Um, she seems much more like an Ionico, kind of Tarasi, uh, <laughs> kind of big, powerful, juicy. I feel you like, know. Uh, uh, James, thank you for chiming in. I feel like we're entering Sex in the City territory, where like I'm more of a Samantha, uh, you know, whatever <laughs> hybrid. And so it's like the Nebbiolo Ionico hybrid or uh... Yeah, there's a lot of power there in, in Zoe, so you know just <laughs> no withering <laughs> violet. Uh, James James thank you for joining us. Uh, James, uh, 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 late life. of late of a star turn Thursday cocktail show. Uh, James, what great for you? Welcome back. What great for you? <laughs> uh, what great do you think I am, Bill? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> Bill Tyler also what great for you. Come on. Jill is Vitis Vinifera. Um, <laughs> she is lover Jill, of all things. Jill is godlike embodying all Yeah. Omnipresent, omnipotent, deathly potent. All right. Well, James, you're going to have to think about that one. Um, uh, and what other questions do we have, Zoe? Oh, man. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I was writing things down. I had a list and I stopped having a list. This is the I stopped having a list bit of the chat. Right um, um, a lot of questions of the best ways that we can support Tail Up Goat and Revelers uh, Hour. Um, I feel yeah. like there's enough of that branding and um, uh, I, you, I think you've read enough missing emails about that. You guys are you guys are too much. So I want to say first and foremost that like um, you know I, I I you know it's important to count your blessings and uh, we you know both at Revelers and at Tilco are gonna be you know as businesses um, are gonna be fine. You know we have enough you know runway to survive this and um, you know remain intact and um, you know remain um, you know uh, open uh, 
throughout uh, this um, you know, winter into um, spring and summer, hopefully eventually uh, without pandemic. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, obviously, you know, you buy shit from us. Um, that's, that's, the, that's the easiest way. I, I um, you know, it, that feels, you know, relatively minor, though, because, um, you know, you, you have a, a whole industry of, of people that are affected. And, and we are hugely privileged in terms of the position we occupy um, for the sake of the, the press uh, and attention that we have uh, received um, and, you know, the resources that are available to us as such. Um, you know, and ultimately it's, it's the, um, you know, restaurants that don't have, you know, the kind of, um, you know, uh, spotlight uh, that, that we do that, that, that do suffer. So honestly, I, I just find myself wanting to support local things in the midst of all this. So, you know, go out of your way to shop at an independent bookstore, to, you know, support a coffee shop that's not fucking Starbucks, to, you know, buy whatever it is you're buying on a smaller scale, um, you know, I, I think that's that's really important, and and you know think about you know the um, uh, the supply chain that you know brings something to your table. I I, I hope that's another lesson uh, for the sake of, of you know what we've done. I think people you know get really worked up about putting food in their body when it comes to you know organic um, you know forms of alcohol, ag like agriculture and no pesticides. So like I feel like like wine gets treated as something different, or you know they don't consider. You know, I mean, I love all these imports, but like they cost a lot to get here, especially in fucking glass, you know, and, and you know, drink local. Like, I'm not going to say that, you know, um, there is a Musar of Maryland. You know, I wish there was. That'd be really cool. But, um, you know, we haven't been making wine for a thousand years in, in, in Maryland. Um, but, you know, uh, you know, find find an underdog to root for locally um, and, and you know, make it, make it your own. Um, you know, you're not going to necessarily um taste wine on the same level uh but you're going to experience something much more profound which is like a wine culture you know that is nascent and becoming and that's always the most interesting you know period of time you know something that's kind of like stagnant and codified is is, is harder to break into but you know if you get it in the ground on you know Anne Arundel wine um you know you're you're gonna you know you're not gonna be set for life um, but, but you're not going to have access to, you're going to have access to it in a way that you wouldn't, if you were just like another, you know, person that wanted to drink Margot. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, I think the, the locality of things, the scale of things matters more to me now than, than it ever has, um, before. Um, this is a great question from Janice. Um, is it common for or easy for psalms or wine buyers um, to know about which wineries are either unionized or paying their field workers? Oh, that's a and that so that should be said that that kind of that, that might trump the um, uh, uh, kind of uh, sexual life of grapes question as the excellent question. Uh, Janice is a great question. I'm um, uh, oh, sorry, excellent question. I have to say on brand. Um, uh, so, um, it's fascinating. So like, obviously wines don't come to, uh, the glass, um, you know, on their own, they depend on a shit ton of migrant labor in this country. Um, and in Europe for that matter, um, in Europe, um, here it's mostly Mexicans, um, in Europe, it's mostly Romanians and, uh, Polish. Actually the Polish are like a little less really the Romanians get their drink on. Um, uh, although if you're Melanie, like sometimes it's locals, like Melanie, her whole, it was actually like really cool to hear her say that like it was like older citizens of her village that still speak Alsatian dialect um, that were her artists. So that's hugely rare. Um, that doesn't happen a lot in the old world. I mean, it does happen at smaller scales, but um, usually it's, it's migrant labor even there, but it's like migrant labor within the European Union. Uh, Karl Marx, Marx, fascinatingly enough, is from a winemaking region. So Karl Marx um, uh, was uh, born um, in, uh, I'm telling the brain part, but, uh, German wine country, um, uh, Trier, um, which is at kind of like the, Trier is at the intersection of this, the, the Saar, the river and the Mosul rivers. Um, and uh, a lot of his understanding of the exploitation of labor, um, and, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the misapplication of capital came from, um, you know, the life of vineyard workers. Um, you know, so, uh, it is really important not only to think about, you know, environmental concerns when it comes to wine, but think about, you know, the 
um, you know, conditions for, for laborers uh, on, on the ground. Um, you know, there's, and, and the, the shitty thing is that there's not a, a reasonable set of certifications for that. Some countries are more um, forward thinking than others when it comes to um, evaluating like a fuller notion of sustainability. So I love about Austria. So um, in Austria, they think of sustainability not only in terms of environmental conditions, but also in terms of um, uh, labor conditions. Um, uh, but that is true throughout Europe. Um, that's why Swiss wine costs what it does, because it's all Swiss citizens, mostly, you know, doing the harvesting. Um, uh, and, and, you know, there is a social safety net in the European Union in a way that there isn't here. And that fucking matters um, in terms of, you know, the kind of, you know, security that you have. Um, you know, so uh, all of these like, global economic forces matter um, in terms of what ultimately ends up in your glass. Um, but there aren't convenient, like, certifications when it comes to that. And there fucking should be. Um, and it's definitely something as an industry that we need to think more about um, uh, and, and work towards because none of this happens in a vacuum. None of the wine, you know, gets through your glass in a vacuum. And it, it makes it all the more important to um, embrace, you know, those people from walks of life, you know, different walks of life that have risen from, you know, somebody that harvests grapes in the field. Like some of my favorite memories of working on a winery are, you know, I've worked at, you know, Beamer, Beamer actually in, in the Finger Lakes, they have a they're, all their harvesters um, work in a nursery. So they're lucky enough to have a nursery so they can consistently employ, um, uh, you know, over a dozen um, formerly actually H1 uh, visa uh, folks um, or whatever the relevant H visa is for migrant laborers who are now full-time because they can, you know, pay them throughout the year because they have this extra nursery, but they also harvest. And being in, har like being in the field with them during harvest is awesome because they're all singing like these goofy ranchero songs um, at like top blast, um, but it's creepy. So they're like, you have to imagine yourself, you're harvesting Riesling grapes. Um, uh, you have like all of these like, you know, uh, you know, Mexican, you know, harvesters like singing goofy ranchero songs. And then occasionally there's this like bird cannon that goes off. So bird cannon is like a, so it's, there are a lot of different ways. So birds eat your grapes, it's bad. Um, you can ply netting, but that's expensive. Or there's a bird cannon, which is like a, just like this occasional pop. So have you ever seen that? Like, it's like that scene in Boogie Nights where that like uh, kid in underwear, like occasionally throws caps. It was like you're in a vineyard and you have to get used to it. Um, it's a really like surreal environment. But if you're in the, if you're in the Finger Lakes and the sun is setting over Seneca Lake, then, you know, there, there is magic uh, to it as well. Um, you know, it's like people from, you know, fucking like Puebla that are, you know, in Western New York harvesting grapes to make beautiful wine. Like, like, what is this world that we live in? You know, it's, it's just really fucking weird and awesome by the same token. And we should live in the wonder of it. But, you know understand it and try to understand it and uh not live in ignorance um so uh that was a long way to dance with janice but like there aren't a lot of good certifications for that um uh, but there 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 should be and it should definitely be something that you think about and it's another argument for buying small because um you know if you're working small then you're dealing with people that are forced to develop honest to god human relationships with their growers uh, and their pickers um and there are pickers they're actually employing people to pluck grapes as opposed to, you know, some weird machine that does it. That was a really long answer. Uh, what, else, what, what, what else you got to say? Any other questions? Hey, Bill, sorry, this is Josh. I saw somebody ask earlier what your favorite wine movie was, and uh, I want to know. Favorite wine movie? Ooh. Actually, I actually I do love Sideways. Um, uh, like Paul Giamatti is like the worst caricature of a wine drinker, but they also like, I mean, I, I, I love, you know, Alexander Payne, the wine make the, 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 the filmmaker, but like they get it right on a lot of things about wine. Like I don't, the, the thing they get wrong is there's no way that the, uh, who's the, it's like Virginia Madsen is at the, 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 there's no way that in a real world, she ends up with Paul Giamatti. There's like, no, there's no way that happens in a real world, but like a lot of the stuff they overstate, you know, it, it feels like a wine movie from a wine lover's perspective um, in, in a really cool way. My favorite movie about like restaurant cultures, like one of my favorite movies, like uh, Ratatouille, I think they get that right. Like in terms of like the brigade system and like the relationship of the front of the house, to the back of the house and stuff like that. They, they, they nail that. Um, there's a goofy Keanu Reeves movie with uh, wine. Uh, that is like strange, <laughs> that I'm, I'm forgetting the name of, like a walk to remember or some shit like that, where like the vineyard burns down, but 
Keanu Reeves is in prominently involved. So I'm all in for anything involving Keanu Reeves and, and grapes. Um, it should be said actually that, so um, I, there was like a period of time where, so there were like uh, the Psalm documentary took, took, took on and I have this fame, not famously, but I have a historically um, uh, problematic relationship with the quartermaster sommeliers and they were the driver behind that movie. Um, and so people would ask me about, they said like, oh, I saw some and, uh, and I would just like, you know, die inside and, you know, have to talk about it. And, you know, but I, I know, I know enough of the guys in that movie to speak and tell me about it. And, you know, I always, I always like reverted to this stock answer of, oh, it's not for me, but I, you know, I, which the stock answer was very true. It should be said, like, it's not for me, but I hugely respect the people that, you know, have you know, kind of uh, committed themselves to um, you know that program and and, and you know have um, you know undertaken the tremendous amount of you know effort it takes to to pass that exam which you know shouldn't you know be understated it's ridiculous it's like samurai shit um, but um, you know by the same token th there were sequels and actually uh, so Justin Wilson um, who was uh, in the first movie uh, they released a third which is actually really cool. Um, and Jancis Robinson is prominently involved, uh, as well as Stephen Spurrier, and sadly Fred Dame, who has since been canceled, justifiably so, because he's a doucher. Um, but uh, he's involved. Uh, but it's actually really cool, like, and it's available on uh, Netflix, and is and is worth, and is actually worth watching. So is there? I feel like you'd be good at this game. Is there a wine movie that you like? Oh, also shit. The um, there's a counter the movie about counterfeiting in um, uh, the Rudy. That's really fucking the documentary. It's really cool. Sour grapes. It's so good. I just watched great. that the other week. Great movie. That was like the rare. One. That's the rare wine movie that my wife genuinely enjoyed. Um, and it gets at this whole notion of like um, this like really awesome philosophical consideration. Like, if the wine tastes good enough, does it matter that it's counterfeit? Like, uh, if the blender is gifted enough to make you think that Jefferson's vinegar is actually the original wine, then like, who gives a rat's ass? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's that that's a great movie. Um, that is a really great movie. Um, uh, and like a really well done documentary, um, which you know is worth its weight in gold in pandemic. Um, so yeah, that that gets a that gets a seal of approval. I I, don't, I need to think of what I feel like. I don't feel like anyone is like actually like nailed it for the sake of wine me making. Like, you know, wine making is it's agriculture. It's like drudgery, and I I don't think that there are a lot of people that have like understood that encapsulated it in in wine form you know and it's like but what's cool about it is like you do a lot of like quotidian like really laborious stuff and then occasionally you taste something or you make a really enlightened decision about you know ultimately what you want to create thompson you've actually worked on a uh vineyard and paid to do so uh do you have a favorite wine movie no <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry uh, no <laughs> I'll tell you actually a least favorite least favorite wine movie is the what's the one with the dude from um who's the amazing voice uh the uh Thulis, uh it's like the um Judgment of Paris movie uh mm, bottle shock with Alan Rickman. Yeah, what is it? It's called Bottle Shock. It has uh, Alan terrible. Rickman in it. So bad. So yeah. bad. Yeah, yeah, it, it, that that one is really bad. Um you know like the same well, like that one. There was a lot of love for Bottle Shock in the comments. Oh, I'm so <laughs> factually inaccurate. Well, so, so like the mouth that sideways is also factually inaccurate. When I was a little baby, saw my mentor um, told me to go watch Sideways and write ten things that they say about wine that at that level I knew to be untrue. And I came back with like a list of like fifteen things that they said. Well, Not to mention that they're drinking Merlot at the end of the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's so. In a styrofoam Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, there are a few, Zoe makes a great point. So uh, A, um, so that movie is is built around, well, it's a it's a good trope. So there's this idea like he poo-poos Merlot and um, he lauds Pinot. And it should be said, like that sounds facile and it sounds like trivial, but it drove wine sales. It drove like thousands of acres worth of planting in subsequent years in this like insane way for the sake of market forces. Um, uh, and everyone is shitting on Merlot and loving Pinot, but the Cheval Blanc that he was drinking was predominantly Merlot um, from the right bank of, Merlo of, of Bordeaux. Um, and um, in as much as Cheval Blanc is one of life's great pleasures, 
Um, and as much as I actually like, I love that he drank it with hamburger. That sounds like fucking awesome. Like I would love nothing more than to drink Chevelle with a hamburger, like a good burger. That sounds great. But you would never drink it out of styrofoam. Like styrofoam in particular is like, you know, a paper cup would be better. Like styrofoam is just like so fair. Like you, if you cared that much, you know, you would at the very least bring one of those like cut off like wine glasses to, to drink it in under the table. You would not drink it out of styrofoam. Like, I don't care if you were that desperate, you would just bring a glass. Uh, even if it was like a plastic, you know, like wine, like the ones we were using at the lot, you would like, you would find a way not to drink it out of styrofoam. Like that, that did bother me about that movie. Um, but although, I mean, yeah, I love all the literary references in that movie. And I, I don't want to, I don't want to poo poo bottle shock too much. Like, that original story is cool. And I've actually been to Montalena. Um, this is like before I was like, you know, making a living out of wine as I do now. And Montalena is gorgeous. It's fucking beautiful. And the wines to this day are really great. And uh, Gingrich, uh, Mike, Mike Gingrich is like a, a hugely talented, you know, winemaker. He has his own label now. Like that story needs to be told. Um, the, the thing I hate about that, well, it's kind of like a, the thing that's goofy about that movie that like, uh, I love is there's that scene where they're like blind tasting in the bar and they make it this like thing. It's just like so fucking goofy. Like that would never, never happen. Um, you know, but anyway, um, I, I guess like, maybe it's like, maybe it's like, I feel like Bottle Shock's like wine or it's like psalm porn. It's like this weird alternate universe that, you know, you know, sommeliers are, are hoping to live in. But th there's yet, I feel like there's a, there's an opportunity there to make a truly like poetic, great, you know, wine, wine movie, you know, that encapsulates something of, and there are a lot of great stories out there. So um, a lot of the great mayors of Paris, um, you know, so there are, you know, read the book like Wine, Wine and War, you know, there are these amazing, you know, Gaston Huet, you know, was a mayor of, of fucking Bouvray, um, survived, you know, the war, like organized a tasting of French wine in, you know, a, a Nazi internment camp. Uh, how can you not make a movie of that? Like fucking, like uh, Constantine Frank came from the Ukraine, was a PhD, worked as a janitor, worked his way up. You know, I want to make that a musical. Um, I've always said that. Like, yes, we can grow vinifera. We are growing vinifera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, but like, yeah, that, like, how is this not a, like, it should be a thing already. Like Angelina Jolie should have made this movie. Um, you know, but no one has optioned the rights yet, but, uh, I, I joke about that with my Finger Lakes friends all the time. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm amazed that there's still, you know, 60 plus people on this, uh, <laughs> and, and hugely grateful. Oh, Heidi, you're muted. Oh, <laughs> you got to plug it in, Heidi. Come on. <laughs> we believe in you. I am so drunk. Okay. When this fucking shit is over, I have a song that I have been working on for weeks in my head that I'm singing to you when it's over, Bill. And we're all together. I'm just saying that now. Oh, nice. Nice. Something to look forward to. Uh, that's both horrifying and amazing. <laughs> Mostly horrifying. Mostly horrifying. Is it in French, Heidi? Please tell me it's in French. It's in English. <laughs> It's in English. And it's like a takeoff on a song that was super popular when I was five years old. And I was born in 1962. So none of you have heard oh. this fucking song ever. That means it's good, though. That means it could be like Motowny. Bingo. <laughs> I hope it's like, baby, I need your loving. Got to have all your. <laughs> heard that song. This is one you probably haven't heard, but you never know. Why but we're going to get through this fucking pandemic, and then I will sing for everybody when we are all together at Reveler's Hour, and I am soberer than I am now. <laughs> um, you know, I, I should, I should, I want to double down on the, like, uh, you don't need to worry about us thing, though. I, I, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty in this moment, but, um, you know, it, it, not to, you know, I look like a nice guy, but uh, I am, you know, hugely stubborn and um you know i would you know have these restaurants pried from my gold like cold dead hands so um you could not you know um you know kind of like i i will i will be here 
Um, so whether you want me to or not, um, you know, you'll, you'll find me. Um, Thompson, you have anything to add? Good. <laughs> uh, so you said, you said you had a, was there, a, you, you said you had a list, you said you had a final question. I keep thinking like you're on the final question, but I feel like there's a final countdown. Uh, my, my final question was, what were the lessons that you learned in 2020? Because I know you're going to. Uh, I already answered that. Yeah. You, you did a very, a very well done, Jensen. No, no, no. It was, it was, that was that was a hard. I thought. I, again, I thought the dog. I thought the dog added that question a lot. Like uh, I think BD is somewhere on the chat. Like <laughs> there, there's a pause. Like uh, typing away. Can, can I add something in we learned from cocktail class last Thursday? All these little wine bottles you have, bring them back to Reveler's Hour. Oh, yeah. to, they're, they're <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. We didn't we didn't know that the first few flights we well, got we, we came out in cocktail class last Thursday. So we sent ours back today and uh, you know, bring them all back. Thank you, David. Like so we felt I felt like initially weird about soliciting um you know requests for or just like uh asking people to recycle things in pandemic because people got weird about like you know shared service and all this stuff but like class is inert um you know it's an amazing vessel um and honestly the more we're learning about um the coronavirus is that like it doesn't really spread that way um you know me speaking you know has you know the it's just like yeah it's like the respiratory stuff that's that's a big worry um so yeah uh we'd love to recycle stuff um and um the, it is, you know, kind of horrifying to see all the um, disposable containers, um, you know, going out uh, for the sake of the takeout world that we're living in now. And we, we certainly love to recycle that stuff and honestly, like, keep keep more people um, at work for the sake of uh, rinsing and recycling uh, all of it. Bill, can I ask a non-wine question? Go. Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about sour beer, which I feel like is moving more oh, into the types that. of things that wine is doing these days? Josh, does that surprise you that I love sour beer? I love no, but I want to hear you expound on it. Josh Ooh. loves sour beer. Oh, it's amazing. So uh, my, I have a like a great love affair with sour beer. Um, my, like Mara and I, my wife and I, our favorite, one of our favorite dates is uh, right proper. Um, uh, uh, the, the tasting room, which, or not the tasting room, the, the restaurant, the original brewery. Um, but uh, um, I, sours are amazing. Um, and, and like just the whole, as a dimension of taste, like I think just sour is like much more interesting than hoppy, um, which is like the place where, you know, most brewers, most American like new brewers were kind of leaning into. And it's very wine-like too. Like sour beers are more wine-like um, in a way that feels very on brand for me. Um, you know, but uh, you know, that, that'd be a fun lesson to do equally. Um, beer, beer doesn't like, I always say that like making beer is kind of like baking, whereas, you know, making wine is kind of like working with a roast or like savory cooking. So, you know, more, working with a wine is more like ingredient driven, whereas like beer making is more like recipe driven. It's more like deterministic. Um, what's cool about sour beers is they kind of like, they make that notion like really muddy um, and like the Cantillons of the world. So like famously, like, you know, you have these like really like fabulous, um, like, I mean, the, the Dutch word's cool shit, but, like, you open the windows and you, um, invite these ambient yeast and they work their magic and you end up with, like, sourdough bread meets beer and, you know, it's amazing. Um, but it's an acquired taste and, uh, but, uh, no, I, I adore it. Um, and if you haven't been already, um, please go to Pendruid. Uh, Pendruid, um, is, uh, a closely guarded secret. Um, it is a bunch of brothers who um, were in this weird, like, um, like indie rock, like, I, I, mean, I forget the name. What was the name of their band? Thompson, what's, a, did, what's their band? They're still in the band. They still oh, sure. What's the band, though? Uh, I always want to say, like, uh, I wanted to make it German, like Rammstein or like Kraftwerk <laughs> or, uh, or Audubon. I want to make it like, uh, like, uh, like the Big Lebowski. Oh. Uh, it's a psychedelic rock band, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. Is... Anyway, they're they're fucking awesome. They, they Bill, they they built a new tasting room. I don't know if you've oh, really? been down there recently. I'm saying so it's been... it's yeah, like basically down before. the road from the old one, oh. but it's completely outdoors. So there's tons of picnic tables. Like it's very safe for all things COVID. Um, so I highly this, recommend going down. It's so this is Sperryville. For those of you that don't know, Sperryville. Three blacksmiths. Yeah, and then go through blacksmiths if you can get a reservation. 
Yeah, Sparrowville's this weird place where they don't get cell phone reception either. It's like this like corner of the universe that is like off the map in an awesome way. Um, and uh, Pendruid is stupid good and deserves. They may, so like I always tell the the brothers who do we usually taste with Thompson Jennings. Yeah, so I would tell Jennings that like what you're doing is better than it has any business being. Like you're doing things at like a preposterously world-class level and no one knows about it and it's criminal, but they're, well, they're yeah. waiting. They're like wedded to this like punk aesthetic where they just don't give a rat's ass, um, which is like awesome. They have a different water source now too. That's like completely changed the dynamic of their beers. Really? Yeah. yeah it's it's really cool. Um, and so they're, they're stoked about the new like iteration of their beers that oh, cool. has happened since they've moved to the new property. And how, how are the really Just around the corner. Um, by the way, their, their band's name is Pontiac with a K. Oh, I knew that. With a K, of course. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I also want to drop a line to the awesome fucking kick-ass women of Denizens because their Southside Sour um, IPA is delicious. They're technically from Maryland, but they're one block into Maryland because they're both former lawyers that became brewers here in D.C. And they found out, like, where exactly is the best place to put their brewery to just to maximize their business. They're amazing. I love them so much. Women owned and local. Oh, and it looks like Sperryville has gotten their uh, cell reception fixed a little what? bit. What? Really? Uh, <laughs> I kind of love that about it. Um, all right, without further ado, uh, it's been emotional, guys. Uh, I'm going to close things out. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I feel hugely privileged um, to. Uh, you know, be a part of this community. You feel hugely privileged that uh, as many of you um, are uh, still still online uh, listening to us, um, you know, uh, chat on uh, as we do. And, um, you know, I you know, am equally, um, you know, honestly, I mean, like burning the, <laughs> burning the rope at both ends to keep businesses open, but also knowing that one day I'm going to be nostalgic um, about all of this. So, um, the, actually the, the, um, there's a great word in Portuguese. They say suadade for that. It's just it's like pain twinged with happiness. So, um, here's to that. Uh, I love you all. Cheers. Alone, Alone together. together.